Welcome, everyone. Happy Wednesday. This is Hollywood on the Rocks. I am Chris Gore. It's going to be a big show today. A lot to discuss, including Ahsoka Episode 7. One more episode left of the show. And today we will also be discussing a bunch of stuff. Uh, a Chinese film called Creation of the Gods Part 1. Kingdom of the Storms. A movie called Cassandro that is now playing on Amazon Prime. Alan will be discussing Farewell, My Concubine, the new 4K restoration. Plus, some filmmakers are going to be joining us on the show. Director John Garcia from the movie Summoning the Spirits and Penitentia director Chris Lawing will also be here. Plus, your chat comments and questions. And Alan Ng, or as I like to call him, Ng the Merciless, will also be here. So let's get things started. Let's kick things off with the opener of the show. It's right at the very top of all the videos that I play. Let's go, let's go, let's get started. Come on, let's start. All right. Well, maybe if I whistle, Alan will show up. He needs to hear. Alan, 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 Al, Alan. Alan. Hey. <laughs> Ing, the, Ing the Merciless. Ing the Merciless. Ing the Merciless. The things I you guys think. do on other, the things you do on other channels. <laughs> well, what's wrong? What's wrong with the things I do on other channels? They're fun. Well, they, somehow they turn into memes and they get sent to me. Yeah. You're a, you're a meme now. Wait, I yeah. can't find it. I wanted to share it on the show. Can you share that picture? Oh yeah, let me. You got to share that picture of you while you're doing that. While you are finding the graphic of yourself that was just memed about uh, an hour ago, I'm gonna see who's here in the chat because we have a lot to discuss. Show is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be moving fast today. It's gonna be lit. It's yeah, as the kids say, lit. It's it's riz. Riz is a word that I just recently try to use in a sentence other thing i want to point out just for the people that are here early is there's only about 150 people here now we usually get like between 500 and a thousand on a wednesday but here's what i want to point out every episode i'm going to change something about my background i'm going to change a minor detail about my background and the first person to find it out and point it out in the chat is going to get something i don't know what that is yet I haven't quite worked it out, but this is my normal background. I changed one thing about it. Perhaps you can point it out and see what it's a reference to. If there is something different about my background, post it in the chat. And there you go. RJP has become a new YouTube member. Thank you for that. Lord Thoughts says, hey, everyone, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, sign up as a member and join us on Discord. That's right. If you become a member, you get access to our Discord. You can continue the conversation. Uh, Bill S. Preston, Esquire. Hey, all folks need to ask X-Ray Girl politely to have Chris and Alan on her new dad cast on Poor Choices. Well, since I shamed X-Ray Girl because it was kind of an idea <laughs> like that uh, I sort of popped in my head like dad cast. Someone should just do a show talking about what it's like to be a dad and different, you know, whether it's advice or just challenges. And uh, she's had everyone on the show except for me. But she's had two uh, shows. She's had two shows so far. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. E everyone's been on it except for me. Uh, she just asked me via DM. And at some point in the next month or so, I will appear on DadCast. I'm going to yeah. give you all my dad tips. Seriously. I'm not yes. joking. You guilted your way onto the show. Uh, of course I guilted her. I guilted. I, I guilted her. But, you know, uh, X-Ray girl. I mean, she's your dog. Hi, Dad. You know what she doesn't miss? Your tattoo. I, have See, a I, I wear it with pride. I why do I have a film threat? Why I need I should have a film threat tattoo of everybody. I should have one. And then uh Bill S. Preston Esquire goes on to say, Horkin, yeah, I'd also love to see Alan on. We need more positive dad conversations. Uh happy to do it. Happy to do it. Uh, Sean Belknap, what are your guys' thoughts on Stand By Me? 
I watched it this past weekend for the first time in a while, including credits and intro. It's 90 minutes. Think of the character development you get. Uh, it's a classic. It's great. It's probably the best thing Will, we Will Wheaton has ever done in his career, which was early in his career. And um, I love that film. It's one of the best Stephen King adapt adapt adaptations. It is interesting to revisit a movie like that to see if it still holds up. So thank you, Sean, for uh, doing that. Alan, any thoughts? No, I totally agree. Uh, I was kind of right in the right age range when that movie came out. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> are you okay? I mean, it was it's weird, but the, there was an era where Rob Reiner did really great movies. And uh, Stand By Me was right in there. Are you all right? <laughs> Chris is dying. But, um, yeah, so I may, be, I may be running the show for the rest of the afternoon. So uh, <laughs> I'm fine. I just needed I see a little drink of water there. Went down the wrong pipe. All right. Onterex23 says, another week, another video by two old guys who have no proper context to properly criticize this show. Absolutely. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Thank you, Antarex. Thank you yeah. for the no no, no the context. Impression. You're damn right. We have zero context for the show. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, that's the fault of the filmmakers, not us. Yeah. And plus, and Kathleen Kennedy herself said, "You do not need to have seen anything else to understand the show." And and as far as I'm concerned, anything Kathleen Kennedy says, you can take that to the bank as a promise that it will be kept. Uh, but yeah, uh, we appreciate you watching. We do receive money from your view. So thank you for the support of the show. Best part is they think Clone Wars is for kids. You know, that little show about war crimes, brutal deaths, and political intrigue. Uh, the animation style to me looked like a show for children. So I checked out. I just checked out. So there you go. But Antarex, you know what? Can I just say? You are welcome here. You are welcome here. And we appreciate different opinions uh sons and shadows is a member well that thumb echoes the show my eyes are still bleeding there you go there's some perspective <laughs> uh sons and shadows because i say no simp cast shirt chris i literally slept in that shirt last night i've been trying oh yeah I just you need did. A dude i just need a no i woke up early i did all my normal three hours of emails in the morning and then i did the nooner and it was a quickie the nooner was a quickie today but I was wearing the Simpcast shirt to bed, but I am dying uh, the new Phantom Liberty level for uh, Cyberpunk 2077 is out, and I haven't had time to play it. I, I, li I just want a day. And this weekend, I'm going to be at the Halloween convention at the Pasadena Convention Center. If you go to, um, it's the Halloween 45, the 45th anniversary of the movie Halloween. Uh, it's a huge convention at the Pasadena Convention Center. I have a weekend pass. I will be there. So I won't have time to even play uh, the game this weekend. Maybe Friday I'll get into it. But thank you, Sons and Shadows. I did shower and change and eat lunch between nooner and now because I actually had time to do it. Um, thoughts on fitness with Nigel's member for nine months. Haven't watched in a while. Tired of the rubbish. You're in the right place. And John Manalang. Shout outs to Alan for saving time in avoiding dumb money. Spot on review. Now, John Manilang, I just want to say that what first I'm not, I, I will never tell someone, including Enterix23, I would never tell a person that their opinion was wrong unless you try to tell me that the sky is green when it's actually blue. Okay, that's extreme case. But your opinion about how you experience a piece of media and or art, sometimes it rises to the level of art. I can't, I, that's personal to you. And Terex, 23, who's probably, I'm going to guess, a little younger than me because he referred to me as an old guy and um, probably watched, uh, you know, Clone Wars when this person was young and impressionable and saw deeper meaning where I did not because I've read books with words. Um, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, is that I would not criticize that. And I'm not, I will not criticize Alan's opinion. He felt differently about dumb money than I did. I liked it better than he did because I felt the movie championed blue collar and the working class. Something stood out to Alan that bothered him. And that's okay. Yeah. 
that is. I mean, I felt rightly about my opinion, and Chris felt wrongly about his, and we are <laughs> completely uh, able to have a conversation about it. Well, I have yeah. an announcement. I have an announcement to make as we go through these, and thank you, John Manalang, uh, for that. Um, an announcement. Hopefully, the banner is prepared for me. Here's the announcement: either. when when Film Threat reaches 100,000 subs, right now we're at 92,100. When we reach 100,000 subs, we will launch a new weekly show. And here's a little teaser of that show. Okay. I'm just going to show, and this, we had a perfect opportunity to actually do a segment for this show, which is basically going to be called Versus. And it's going to be Alan and I, or others, fighting about things that, uh, things we disagree with. The new show is called Versus. Here's a little, so what we might do is actually go through the comments on something like the Dumb Money Review, where Alan, for, I don't know, in a rare case, is getting all this love, and everyone says, I'm wrong, that's fair. But I intend to fight. Versus is going to be our new show that launches after we reach a hundred thousand subs. So if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. And we are uh, only 8,000 away. We're 8,000 away, but on the trajectory we're going, we're not going to make it before the end of the year. Well, if we make it before the end of the year. It'll be a miracle, but I don't know. Loki okay. is coming out. Uh, let's see. Aquaman. <laughs> Aquaman too. And there's new that new that, um, V the shows, Marvels. the V Academy or whatever it is. The boys, like it's a spinoff show from the boys, but when we reach a hundred thousand subs, we're going to launch the new show and we will be announcing the date that we will be doing critics court star Trek, but we got to get to a hundred thousand subs. I want to, I want us to have a substantial audience to be able to, to do these no sh new shows because it's a lot of work to put this together now. Well, it's not, I mean, it's sometimes it's work. Alan kind of just skates in at the last minute every week. Yeah, Cause I have a website to run. Yeah, exactly. Why well, have a YouTube channel? I got 30 writers to manage. I get just, I, you know, look, when I'm mad at Alan, I'm only fake mad at Alan, not mad mad. But um, here, I want to show you something else because I want to get uh, a chance to vote. Here's the vote. Should we review this movie or should we not review this movie? There is a new movie out. It's called Periodical. I'm going to show you the poster for this movie, only the poster. So we're going to do a poll. Should we review the movie periodical? If you go to the film threat Instagram, the film threat Instagram is pretty much a feed of, well, weird memes and videos of Alan and I, uh, you know, I do those every couple of weeks. And then uh, it's basically a feed of movie posters. Why? I love movie posters. I love movie posters. I love movie posters almost as much as Alan love refrigerators. Alan, I'm do you love refrigerator? I love refrigerator. <laughs> Your timing I, is impeccable. <laughs> it's terrible. Look, I love, I love movie posters. I just love movie posters. So, I mean, I think they're, they rise to the level of art. I have a collection of movie posters, a bunch of different tubes filled with them. I don't have nearly enough wall space to display all my great and rare posters. But sometimes we get a poster for a movie that intrigues me so much. I'm thinking, what, how? I'm going to share this with you right now. So if you're listening to this, um, and I'll, I'll describe it if you can't see it. It's a movie poster for a movie called Periodical. It's from MSNBC Films. And the tagline on it, it's a, it's a grouping of flowers. And the flowers is in the shape of women's underwear with a bunch of red flowers sort of spewing at the bottom. And it says, it's time to change the status flow. Alan, tell me what you think this movie is about. Oh, it has to be about, uh, if I'm lucky, it's about abortion. Uh, but if <laughs> not, but based on the subtitle there, it's about uh, menstrual cycles. And, I'm going to uh, guess, 
And, and by the way, MSNBC submitted this movie to the Film Threat website to be oh, you're reviewed. Kidding. You're it kidding. was submitted. It was no look up the submissions, Alex. Oh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm looking it up now. Our audience is going to decide in the next five minutes should we review periodical just based on the poster or should we not review periodical? <laughs> I am leaving it up to the audience. I want the, I want our audience to decide, do we review it or not? Alan, your thoughts. Well, let's see. Uh, so film subjects, Naomi Watts. Okay. I'm in. Okay. So a no, glorious Naomi item, is- glorious item, right. cl- classic feminist, uh, Megan Rapino, the, the, uh, soccer player. Okay. Uh, Anna Kunkel, I don't know her. Madeline Morales and Anusha Singh. I think that's the golfer. Uh, or someone. Uh, oh my god. All right, we've got I mean, do you want here. me to talk about what the you want let me give you the brief log line here? Yeah, let's hear the log line from, but also only three more minutes we're gonna go because we've got about five hundred people watching. You're gonna decide should we review periodical or not? It's up to you, the audience. Alan, what what uh what what yeah. is the official okay. log line? I read the, here's the official log. Okay, here's the official log line. Tells the unexpected story of the human body by exploring the marvel and mystery of the menstrual cycle from first period to last. Okay. Well, Isn't that there you go. There you go. Uh, I, look. Look, it, it's we just get some stuff that's in that kind of blows my mind. Oh, here's a, here's a a note uh, through innovative mixed media storytelling. Periodical is for everyone who wants to know more about the menstrual cycle, and especially those who don't. I I think I would be in the last camp of those who don't. I just I know enough about it that if I have to make a a, a grocery run. And I, I, I am the person that is tasked with purchasing tampons. Okay. I make sure to buy a lot of other stuff to mix in with the tampons. Like, oh, this is an afterthought. I'm really here to get a box of Snicker bars. So let's look at the results of the poll. Uh, Ms. P. Coffee, if we could cut oh, off here. the poll. I want to read one more thing. I got to read one more thing. Okay. One more thing before uh, we cut off. Okay. Bring you stories from soccer champion Megan Rapino who uh, reveals how members of the U.S. soccer team track their cycles when training for the Women's World Cup. Um, all right. Let's see. Okay, quickly vote. Everyone vote. Your votes are in. Your votes are locked. Over 500 people watching. Uh, we'll see how well democracy works here. What are the results of the poll? Is democracy get... dead? Is democracy dead or what? Wait, did the poll just start a minute ago? Two minutes ago? Well, what happened? It did. Okay. Oh. I think the poll is still going. Oh, no. She just. Okay. It was just started. So it now, started. now you're voting on it. Now you're voting on it. All right. Let's we'll do it. Yeah. I think when I said four minutes left, I meant four minutes left to vote. Like actually just start the poll. Yeah. No reason to wait. No reason to wait. <laughs> so, I can tell you right. the, chat, the chat is currently mixed. Oh, the chat yeah. is mixed. See, that's People, what I hope. Yeah. Let me read some super chats here while we're waiting um, and we'll get the results. Chris, where can I order a, the attack of the doc Blu-ray from Germany without paying massive shipping costs? Says Alex pans. Uh, you cannot um, Alex. If you go to shop.filmthreat.com or attack of the doc.com, it's expensive to ship Blu-rays to Germany. It's an all region disc. So you'll be able to play it but I have no other way of doing it. And my apologies. We've got, uh, you know, first of all, we're sold out, but we will have, we'll be restocked before the end of October. Um, there's no way to order it. If you, if you want the Blu-ray, you've got to, pay. now you'll have something that's probably, here's what I would do. Can I, can I offer a suggestion? Alex pans order two copies of the Blu-ray signed, have them shipped to Germany. Sell one in Germany for what you paid for the two, and you basically got a disc for free. Well, there you go. Pilgrim Media for two says, in a great quote, never mind the bollocks. Yes, I remember that. And thoughts on fitness with Nigel for 199 uh, uh, pounds. 
it would be cool to do a positive review channel. We have a lot of positive reviews. Yeah. We have a lot of positive reviews. I mean, look, we can only be honest. It's sometimes positive and sometimes negative. And I would say like, it's most stuff is middle of the road, right? And then there's like the 10, 20% that is incredibly mediocre, 10, 20% of stuff that's really good. And everything in the middle is just meh. And there you go. Uh, the Marvels and the Acolyte will launch a zillion YouTube videos, says Patrick <laughs> Lemire. I'm going to cover it. Uh, yeah, no Quatrina yeah. VR. I can't bring myself to care about dumb money because Seth Rogen has pissed me off to the point that I can no longer look at him. Hey, it's me and HD was actually interested in dumb money until I saw the promo with Seth Rogen trying to convince how he played the everyman. He, he doesn't play the everyman. He plays an asshole. Um, Seth Rogen in dumb money is one of the antagonists. He's a villain. He's actually an incredible prick in the film. He does not play an everyman. So you misinterpreted that. Hey, it's me and HD. John Z. Or 999 film threaders got your back we're going to get 8,000. chris you always go on other shows it's time for them to return the favor chris i love movie toast posters too bro but not as much as i love alan oh there you are yeah. uh, sean there's z positivity for, there there you go sean z for 199 i almost said it in an accent i'm gonna avoid that that's it's also not my bit it's someone else's bit uh Gary's bit. 199 review good or bad we learn. See? It's just there you go. Yeah. Bad, By the way, there bad. was a show, there was a show where we liked every movie we presented and it got our lowest views. Is that is that fair to say? All I can say is this, outrage uh outrage sells. I know. And uh we Sadly. get when we sit there and tell you I saw a movie I really loved, people are like, "Yeah, whatever." What? You hated the new blah blah blah? You know, or, or the fun one is oh, you liked it a shill. You're a total shill. Yeah, exactly. You're a shill, Alan. You're a shill. Actually, speaking of Alan being a Disney shill, Alan, show us what oh, Disney yeah. just sent you. Yeah, we need to go full screen on this one. Yeah. So, look, I, I got a free subscription to D23, um, and I forgot to cancel it. Uh, and so this year, uh, D23 sent us. Uh, it's the 100th uh, anniversary Mickey statue and uh look how beautiful that is it's uh and look listen it's total plastic it's plastic you know, it's plastic it, it, the base weighs more than the uh than the actual mickey there that's lame all right uh just a few more chat comments and questions before we pivot to star wars talk i know that's why you're all here uh and we're gonna reveal the results of the poll we've got about 600 people watching bad adam 12 for 10 periodical Sounds like a watch party so we can riff on it. Maybe we're going to be doing some watch parties. We're going to bring those back in the fall. Joshua Newton, you need to take a long break from YouTube and reviewing films and TV shows or be admitted to a mental institution. Mm. Uh, why would you say that? I mean, look, Joshua, with all due respect, you can disagree with my opinion. Why would you say something like that to someone? You may really have to ask, like, I see the way treat people treat each other online. And I know Alan well enough to joke with Alan. Alan also knows I'm joking. Uh, but why would you say something like that? You need to ask yourself that, Joshua. Um, your unkind words will not be returned with kindness. Latino slant, gore is negative AF. Oh my gosh. It just, and they're just pounding on. Polly, Andrew Wall, what's your favorite movie poster? I can't answer that question. That is difficult. Um, I do like that there's sort of differences between, um, you know, different types of movie posters. There's the teaser poster. There's the full poster, the one sleeve, they call it. Then sometimes they do character posters. That would be impossible. I have favorites throughout the years. You know, I like Return of the Jedi where it's just, the hand holding the lightsaber with just sort of little details. Um, I don't know, but that's impossible. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. Andrew. But what's sad is the, this trend of the, the cast head uh, poster where it's just, you know, angles of, of the, the cast right. of the entire. 
we don't have a lot of time. So uh, we're going to a few more super chats. Then we're going to get the results of our poll. Then we're pivoting to star Wars West for four nine nine. Will our SoCal IMAX theaters bring back Oppenheimer 70 millimeter IMAX? Uh, my prediction is yes. And I'll tell you why, because Dune part two is not coming to theaters this year. So I believe that Oppenheimer will be returned to theaters sometime, probably over the holidays in December um, when there's not a lot going on and it'll be a run for award season. No one is watching Barbie IMAX, but Oppenheimer was still packed when they pulled it. Yes, it will return. The Morak for 199. Hi, Chris and Alan. Any thoughts on the creator? Neither of us have seen it yet. I'm seeing it tonight. We will talk about it on Friday. Alan? I'm seeing it tonight. Yeah, good. We're both seeing it tonight. We will give you everything on Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Thoughts on fitness with Nigel for 199 pounds. Chris, have you got the gauntlet poster from 1976? I do not have that. But what I really like are French posters, these kind of giant ones, which are amazing. Um, if you go to the Alamo Draft House in Los Angeles, Tim League took movie posters from his personal collection and plastered the walls with like Italian sci-fi posters. And I love like the foreign posters, like look up the Polish poster for the empire strikes back. It's the weirdest. There's this whole series of movie posters from Poland or like very popular movies you've heard of where they just look weird, but I don't have that poster and final super chat before we pivot. Uh, MK solid 82 for four nine nine. Chris, I can't believe JJ is going after Krull. The original film is like Shakespeare is anything safe anymore. Well, JJ ran out of things to destroy. <laughs> That's seriously it ran out of things to destroy. Frankly, uh, here are the results of our poll. Should we review the movie periodical, which is a documentary movie from MSNBC, MSNBC films about women's periods. No, 53%. <laughs> yes, 46% with 325 votes. That's uh, about half of the people that are watching. So just like the, you know, the American electorate, about half the people vote. So that's good. That's good. Um, all right, we're not going to review it. We'll review, how about this? We'll review it on the website, right, Alan? Sure, sure. I am sure I could find someone to. So find review. someone to review it. Yeah, but we were not going to review it. We will not review it on the show. And thank you very much for that. That was fun. All right, Doc Savage for five. Just give me, just give mad props to Gore for being in Star Trek Continues. That ish is legend. Uh, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I was invited by Vic Mignana to uh, go to Atlanta to go to the sets. It was like summer camp for Star Trek nerds. I play a bit part in the beginning of one of the episodes. I think it's episode or of it um in any case look up star trek continues i am an alien uh and i try to kill captain kirk and it was uh i don't know it was super fun to be in that show and uh i i really really enjoyed star trek continues so look that up but thank you for that uh alan's daughter should review it says well oh, we should get x-ray girl to review it and come on x-ray girl can review periodical i'll send it to her and Mike dude for four nine nine hot take make Ahsoka two change Dave Filoni's movie into heir to the empire trilogy with Luke Han and Leia as the main characters. I think everyone's been asking for that. Everyone's been asking for that. So there you go. One last super chat before we pivot. Uh, John Thomas for five. Did you review in retirement plan? That's the movie with uh, Nicholas cage. I enjoyed it. An okay. Dark comedy cage being cage social commentary falls flat, but igno ignorable. Uh, yeah, Alan reviewed it about two weeks ago. And we interviewed the director. We And we interviewed the director of the movie, and Alan reviewed it, and people seem to enjoy that movie. Yeah. So there I, you go. I kind of liken it to a episode of the A-Team. Yeah, it looked... I only saw the trailer, but it looks really fun. It looks really fun. Uh, really quick, before we talk about... Let's see. Before we talk about... Star Wars, the latest episode of Ahsoka, episode seven. I want to discuss this thing that um, it was on my personal social media on Twitter. Uh, I found it, I believe it was Robert Meyer Burnett, is where I found it. And it's a Twitter user named Daugi. 
is D O U G G Y Dougie Pledger is the name, uh, who is apparently a special effects artist. You can go to Dougie D O U G G Y dot com. He posted a two minute video that which you and I are going to react to. It is celebrating 100 years of Star Wars. This thing has now gone viral with uh, almost 2 million views at last count. It is a vision of Star Wars as if Star Wars was made 100 years ago in the silent film era. It is absolutely beautiful. If you've not seen this, I'll put a link in the description of this episode. I want to watch it with you, Alan, if you've not seen this. And anyone who's not seen this, it's only two minutes. Quick reaction, then we're pivoting to Ahsoka. But uh, check this out, Alan. I just want you to see this. Wow, that's pretty good. This is so creative. You've got sort of BB-8 mixed in, old silent. Oh my gosh. It's look at how epic this is. It obviously uses a lot. This is the future. I look at something like this, and it's almost like, have you ever seen the um, comic book series Gotham by Gaslight? Uh-huh. Which is like, if Batman existed in the uh, like 1800s, <laughs> yeah, though that is sort of a turn me on you doing it. Roger, I'm Steve. Who the F is Roger? Uh, now you know how Yoda Batman. got his role in the film. Explain, I shall. So many hearts, why must I break? And you've got Dark Vader doing mundane things like grocery shopping, going. It's like a strong man. Dark Vader playing with kittens. It is nothing. If you've not seen this, uh, unbelievable, unbelievably creative. A lot of people have been commenting on this against the fights meters. You've got Uncle Palpatine as like a good boy. Uh, now you've got like to get off my set, you drunk buzzball. So you've got Chewbacca as a drunk. This S will send you to the moon. So you've got then like Chewbacca is sort of a stoner. He's like drinking and like smoking weed. I'm so sorry. You see Chewbacca and Yoda both in court. This Wookie Yankee I find. And then it shows the Marquis of Star Wars. You've got I took you to a Supreme And this is the kind of creativity because. Ultimately, Star Wars was inspired by old leadership, like Ash Gordon, Rogers, in a galaxy effing ages ago. And there you go. I thought it was really creative. Link is in the description. Uh, Alan, what are your thoughts? That was amazing. Um, the first question that comes to my mind is, you know, I've played around with AI a bit, and the ones I use won't let me use copyrighted material like Star Wars. I'm just curious how you know, what they did to do that. But other than that, it, yeah, it, it's just, I'll say it, it's nostalgic. And uh, and I I thought it was clever. So I'm, well, I'm what's, very what's, happy. What's interesting is it harkens back to the mm-hmm. influences for the original Star Wars. Uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis was uh, influenced um, the look of C-3PO. If you go back and watch The Robot from Metropolis by Fritz Lang, silent film, German silent film, uh, that's the inspiration for C-3PO. Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, Emperor Ming was the inspiration for the Emperor in Star Wars. So uh, I really think it's fascinating. Um, I like that. It's creative. I kind of felt that the prequels might have been more like that, more sort of Flash Gordon-y, you know, more like... Uh, so um, there you go. John Thornton says, how is AI creative? Let me tell you how it's creative. I can't do that. Can you do that? Can you make that? Because I can't do that. I don't know how to do it. Do you know what? Photoshop is used to do a lot of creative things. I can't use Photoshop. Photoshop and a brush with paint in the hands of an artist can result in art. But I can't do that. There are certain things. I Look, I have different skills, whatever. AI is a tool and will be a tool in the right creative hands, just like a brush, a paintbrush is a tool, just like Photoshop is a tool, just like any other tool for an artist. And AI, and I'm going to quote a script doctor, AI is misnamed. It's not artificial intelligence. It's simulated intelligence. So it's a mashup of old and new and what previously existed. 
AI can't create anything new. It can, it can do, it's good for mashups and it's, it's useful in the hands of a creative person, like the person who created that video. And I think that you need to dive a little deeper into how uh, this so-called AI works because only in the hands of people who truly understand it, can it be used correctly? So it's not going away. You know, it's just, it's just another tool for filmmakers to do something, which is tell a story. There you are. Um, yeah, I think AI, the, this, the distinction has to be between the AI can be a tool to create something uh, or, or to enhance something, but it can't, it's not a tool that can create anything. Uh, it, it, it cannot think of something from thin air. Um, and I think that's the problem is when we think about it, when we want to start using it to, to give new thoughts, to give, bring new ideas to light, uh, AI is just not going to do that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a debate that's worth having. I'm not, I'm not completely, I don't completely believe AI is evil. Uh, oh, I, I, I can be helpful, but I, I can see it being used in bad ways. Oh, I can't wait to use AI on the next film that I make. There are places where I'll be able to use it. Now, am I going to use that? No. I am going to put it in the hands of an artist. I'm going to describe exactly what I need, and I will be using it for the next project that I embark on. Uh, Imperfect says AI equals black magic. Two super chats here just came in. Jeff Peterson for 10. Do you notice that many people conflate enjoying a film and that film being well-written or crafted? What is your approach response to these people when talking storytelling and movies? Uh, I don't think they've watched enough films. I really think that a lot of the bad takes are just um, uh, ill-informed opinions. Uh, Harlan Ellison used to say, um, they, th there's a common phrase, everyone has the right to their opinion." Harlan Ellison does not agree with that common held belief. He believes that everyone has a right to their informed opinion. So for example, if you said Transformers Rise of the Beasts was the best movie I've ever seen, I would say to you, you have not seen a lot of movies. And so when I see ill-informed opinion, I like to say, well, those are kids that probably watched a lot of things with fondness when they were young, and that's fine. And I would not, I would not criticize their opinion. I would say, I would say, I really look forward to the next generation criticizing a lot of things in the same way that we do. Saying that's not the Ezra that I remember. How are they using Ezra this way? Oh my God, they ruined Ezra. Fine, you know, I I I enjoy diversity of opinion. Um, I come at it from a different place, and you are free to agree and or disagree with me. And we've got uh, almost 800 people watching live. Please subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed and uh, and give a like to this video. Another, thank you for your super chat, Jeff. Uh, the Red Ranger for 999 with the state of Star Wars and how dumb the New Republic is. Here's what I'll say about the New, Re the New Republic is what it's like to work at Disney corporate. There's a lot of red tape, a lot of red tape. I'm pretty much... Team Emperor Palpatine. Disney has made me root for, for uh, when he ran things. If only he and Darth succeeded in deleting Sabine. Well, thank you, Red Ranger. Thank you for that. And uh, Hodgman says, Chris, I'd love to help you with my AI skills in any way that I can. Hodgman, you know how to reach me. I have a new project I'm working on. I can't talk about it. It's a little ways off, but um, Hodgman, reach out to me. Go to filmthreat.com slash contact. Thank you for that. Now, time to pivot. Folks, I'm a little like, I'm kind of on a little edge today. Like my patience you might yeah. say, is wearing a little thin. Uh, it is what it is. Oh, I had one more thing to talk about before we pivot. We're not going to get to all these reviews. I have like nine other films I want to review. But, uh, oh, and by the way, we, um, if you go to the store tab on the Film Threat YouTube channel, we just were able to get some of our products from our Film Threat you, uh, store. Sh you go to shop.filmthreat.com. You can literally, while you're on YouTube, just go to store and you'll see a bunch of stuff in our store. But guess what? The strike is over. Yay. The strike is over. Uh, so what's the deal? Well, guess what? I'm going to put a link in the description. Do you want to read the deal? Was this worth holding out for? 
I'm not sure if it, if it, if it was ultimately Alan, what are your thoughts on the strike being over? You know, it was fun while it lasted. Um, it, you know, I remember the, uh, what was it? The 2008, 2007 writer strike, uh, how it shut down Hollywood, how it shut down television. You know, I was a big watcher of, uh, of late night television at that time, big Conan fan. And um, I remember they shut it down. And then around Christmas time, uh, they decided that they were going to go back, do shows, but without writers um, this, this time around, I could care less about whether, uh, you know, whether, you know, stop watching late night a long time ago. Right. Uh, not, not, they not excited that they're back now. Um, you know, it's just it's just one of these things where there's you, you felt like you were watching this big battle out there somewhere and that you're not involved in it and you have no interest in the stakes of it other than, you know, realizing, you know, you just you, I don't think I was that invested in this conflict that I was in the past when the writers when the strike happened 20 years ago, uh, when the when the writer strike happened 10 years ago. And uh, and it, I just felt like I, I, I found myself having trouble sympathizing with either side and uh and part of me when reading the the uh, agreement here is like i'm not sure that things are going to change a whole lot you know well, I, you know yeah this agreement is not much different from the agreement that was god last summer was yeah. proposed I mean, there it's always about money it, right. you know it sounds like that ai sure you know the the writers room is the one that really bugged me the most and um but it's like, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't have the confidence that we're going to see a turnaround in in the quality of product that that the big studios are going to give us. Well, look, was it worth it? We'll see. Um, I, I uh, what's going to happen? I know from uh, people who are WGA members who have reached out to me. Uh, what this will do is strain budgets for television. And you're going to see 600 TV shows over the next few years become only 300 shows. The sort of like gold rush of streaming, 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 yeah. make lots we of shows. Content. Make lots of sh More it's content. Over. It's done. It's done. That is over. And so you're going to see in, in a very short amount of time over the next year to two years, show, you're going to see half the number of TV shows that currently exist. And that is just the reality because the money isn't there. And uh, was it worth fighting for in the end? We'll see. But what I'm also told is you're going to see an entire group of people working in this industry that will more than likely leave the industry and not return. Meaning you might go to a bar or a restaurant in Los Angeles Someone who worked on She-Hulk is suddenly serving you a Moscow mule. You just don't know how these things are going to work out. Who knows? But ultimately, I'm going to post the link in the description. Um, you know, we're not a legal channel. This isn't Nick Ricada. So we're not going to take a deep dive with it. But if you're curious, you can look at the 94-page agreement and check it out. But what this has done, it was an opportunity. Here's, here's what it really was. At the bottom line, at the end of the day, the studios and the producers wanted this to happen. Mm -hmm. They starved the, the writers and they, they basically uh, starved them to the point where it's just like, okay, this is what you want. This is what you get. And this was a take it or leave it deal. And it's just going to result in fewer shows being made because the money's not there and an opportunity to cancel deals that they already wanted to cancel anyways. That's my final thought on it. Um, a couple of comments here, unless you have a comment, Alan. Yeah, you know, I mean, looking at what they ultimately got, in the end, what it was was the producers wanted this, the writers wanted that, and it looks like they came down the middle for it. And and you wonder why did it take that long to to get to basically a, a middle of the line consensus here? Um, and I think I think that goes to what you were saying is that yeah, the studios wanted to get out of all these deals that were were going to be bad that they, they knew they couldn't get out of. Uh, and the strike was the perfect reason to walk away from those without penalty. And I think if you're right, and that half of the production is going to, if production is going to be cut in half, uh, logic would tell you that the bad writers are the ones who are going to go fall by the wayside. 
you know, that the, I think Hollywood, I think the studios are going to be starving for real writers to, to produce products that people will actually watch. And, mm -hmm. and so maybe that's the good thing that comes out of all this is that, uh, you know, to contradict what I said just minutes ago, uh, maybe this was a good thing and that we're, we're, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff. Right. Uh, all right. Uh, a few comments and we're going to talk Ahsoka. I promise. Uh, I'd rather watch Skibbity Toilet, says the nerd far away. By the way, I was on Temu the other day, uh, which is actually where I got this hat, this animation hat. Do you see R2-D2 is wearing? Mm -hmm. He's basically wearing Monkey D. Luffy's hat. Okay, I got that on Temu for like $2. Uh, there, I found there are Skibbity Toilet action figures that actually exists. So there you go. Um, the Geek and I podcast half the amount of TV shows, three times the amount of reality shows. <laughs> yep. That's going to happen. MK Solid 82, Chris is on edge today. But when I have people coming after me, look, you can criticize my opinion all day. If you want to be rude and unkind, I will return the same. Yeah. Normally, if I'm in a good mood, I let it roll off. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not taking it. <laughs> not taking it i'm yeah i'm on a little edge today it says mk solid 82 you hit it so there you go intro the introspect thank you the introspect m says i wouldn't trust a she hulk writer to serve me water yeah well, could, there you go she, could, uh, i'm just assuming it's a she but could the writer write down your order correctly that's all right saying. exactly exactly and uh well let's get right into it then uh let's get into ahsoka Ahsoka episodes. Wait, oh, you know what? Who's Ahsoka? Who says the contrarian 420 for two says, Who's Ahsoka? This is what I'd like to know. We're going to talk about episode seven of Ahsoka. Who is Ahsoka? Why does she matter? And why do we care? Alan, give us your review and your take on episode seven. Oh, man. You know, the, the, the problem with covering the series is trying to come up with new things to say each week and not repeat the old stuff uh because you know uh, like kenobi the the movie the the show started bad for seven episodes in and it hasn't improved a, at all um so my walk away from this one is is that uh there's just not a lot of weight behind anything uh, right. in this it, it, it scenes should mean something um you know, it should be more than just people emoting all over the place. You know, they, it should say something about the story. It should say something about something bigger than the than the story itself. Uh, it should say something about these characters and why they are important. Um, and, and the classic for me is this whole Ezra thing. Um, last week, you know, Sabine met Ezra and they hugged, and that was that was kind of the weight of that scene. Uh, you know, you you never got the sense that they had been separated. Uh, by the Great War, you know that all the events of the original Star Wars movie took place between when uh, Sabine last saw Ezra, and they're finally back together. And it's like, you know, you you would think there'd be some crying, um, I don't know, a, a tighter hug, maybe maybe some kissing. I don't know their relationship. No context. I have no context. Um, and then the same thing happens with uh with Ahsoka here, and um. You know, it's like the, the thing that puzzles me is is uh, Thrawn, uh, you know, it was Ahsoka's here. Well, it was meant to be, you know, you know, I kind of get the fact that maybe uh, maybe Thrawn is a Calvinist, uh, believing that all events were meant to happen. And that right. Uh, but, it, you know, I, let's face it. I've seen Christian movies handle a Calvinism better than than Ahsoka here. Well, so, um uh, I mean, ultimately, yeah. this whole this whole episode is just chase scenes, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, look, Grace Randolph. I'll, I agree with her. This move, this episode was filler because uh, not much happened. You know, it, it was. You know, if you take out all the filler of this series, you'd have a pretty good movie or a halfway decent movie. Oh, um, at but, least a, at least maybe a watchable film. Yeah. Make some changes. Yeah. Let's but... let, let's put it that way. Um, one comment I meant I put it on. Uh, I, I X'd it last night, but it was, uh, you know, even Ezra realizes that lightsabers are useless. You know, it, it, you know, I'll go back to what I've always said about this series is that, uh, or what I say about Disney Star Wars 
is it's not for us anymore. You know, I, I think I'm very happy just to take my old Star Wars uh, and uh, and just make it that and, and have to realize that Star Wars has moved on from me. It's not for me. It's not. It's for this new generation. Um, because I think if if I were going back to uh, Mr. Newton's comments, um, you know, it's it, it's kind of like uh, Star Wars is my ex-wife and married a richer, more handsome person than myself. And how much longer can I just sit and wallow and uh, be angry at the at my ex-wife and her new husband? And th that's kind of where I'm getting to the point with Star Wars right now. Wow, uh, that was very personally revealing. <laughs> uh, but like, I'm still you're... I'm still married to my first wife. So okay, all right. Well, let's let's a couple things I want to address before we get to specifics about uh, events in this episode. One, I think the reason someone mentioned earlier, and there are a lot of people attacking. There are a lot of people attacking those who don't like the show. Okay, they didn't come after people over Boba Fett or Obi Wan, which were awful shows, but definitely coming pe after people who dislike Ahsoka. Uh, I think that different opinions about a thing can coexist, meaning you shouldn't allow my yuck, uh, allow my opinion to yuck your yum. You just, it, it, that's fine. But I really believe that the reason there, um, so many people participate in a discussion of the death of Star Wars. We had our critics court, which went on, probably almost too long, went on almost three months. It went on for three months, actually, our critics court trial uh, on Star Wars. And I feel like we should have waited and included Ahsoka. But the reason I believe all of this is resonating with people. And what I mean is not the show Ahsoka, the conversation surrounding the death of Star Wars resonates with people because in a way it's a form of therapy. I believe this is a form of therapy, uh, not just for myself, but for a lot of people that feel that Star Wars did not live up to their expectations, whether it's, you know, the Star Wars prequels, whether it's the Star Wars sequel trilogy from Disney, whether it's the Star Wars television shows. And the bottom line, I believe, is Star Wars was never meant to be television. I think that Star Trek makes great episodic television, uh, morality tales about uh, our time, but through the lens of science fiction. So it's not directly saying something. It's a commentary that doesn't force uh, a certain point of view. It allows you to say, huh, that's worth thinking about. I'll come to my own conclusion. That's what Star Trek does well, television. Star Wars is epic, an epic fable centered on a heroic character uh, surrounded by uh, many to help that character, whether it be Luke, whether it be Anakin. I mean, in a way, I would. I mean, I, uh, I, I would love to see someone recut the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, intercut them, and call it the Godfather Two cut. So you mirror the same moments where Anakin and Luke had choices to make, and how each made different decisions. Could be an interesting thing. You could even include music from the Godfather, whatever. Anyways, um, I think that in some way, discussions of Star Wars is a form of therapy because we didn't get what we wanted. Now, that doesn't mean that the people who watched every episode of Rebels and every episode of Clone Wars can't enjoy it. And I'm happy for them. But my opinion doesn't negate your opinion and vice versa. And if we're going to be able to have productive discussions, we should respect each other's opinions. You see the way that Alan and I interact. I mean, look, I get, I do get mad at Alan sometimes. Well, probably actually every episode I get <laughs> mad at Alan for something, but it's always something stupid, right? Like it's always, and we know we work with each other enough. We're like, uh, we're goofing on each other, or there's like some dumb meme or video, but yeah. um, this, this, you know, let's, let's actually break it down and start going through the show. So this is why I feel that, Negative conversations surrounding Star Wars resonate because there's a generation that in their mind's eye had a Star Wars that they wanted to see when they were kids. And not just myself who saw it in first run, but other kids who grew up watching Star Wars, whether it be in second run at the theaters or VHS tapes 
or DVDs or on television, however you saw it for the first time. Most people remember the first time they saw Star Wars. Um, everyone imagined what new Star Wars adventures would be like. And what would it be like if Han, Luke, and Leia were in a new series of movies together and we finally got to see that and it was a colossal disappointment? It's really difficult. That's why I think the trial with the way that it did is it's it's difficult to defend the Disney Star Wars sequels. However, and just playing devil's advocate, I believe that the fans of Rebels and Clone Wars, their love for the Ahsoka series is valid. I don't think there's anything wrong with with and i actually think that um you can't really criticize the actors in this show i think the actors are very good i think the weakness in the show ultimately comes down to the writing what do you talk why do you smile i was looking at I keep, every time i see Ezra, every time i see ezra i'm thinking oh that's jesus uh, he does look like jesus from one of those especially, bad especially from the chosen um no right. the only thing i'll say this it's, it's okay. not like we didn't talk like this when phantom menace came out yeah, you know, we were having these same, these same conversations. It was like, you know, we talked about how how what we thought the prequels would look like uh, and right. what George Lucas thought the prequels would look like were, were vastly different. And and the division was just as great. Uh, you know, there I would say that there were probably more people who hated the the, the prequels than liked it, but there was still a strong contingent out there that that liked it. And and I will say as I liked the prequels, I loved Phantom Menace and I think uh, I think Attack of the Clones is a is a hot piece of garbage. Um, but uh, but that 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 was the thing is you know we we can't have these conversations. Well, <laughs> we I'll, don't have I'll, to build divide. I'll debate you on this on a couple things. One mm -hmm. episode one wasn't what we wanted it to be. It was very and it had a weak performance. I'm sorry by a Jake Lloyd who was miscast. I'm I'm sorry he was miscast. I, the other look, I will agree with you. Jake Lloyd was miscast. I, I've miscast. seen I've seen the other actors' uh, screen tests. And they were light years better than Jake Lloyd. Right. The second thing is the other weakness of that film was I don't hate, I'm not a Jar Jar hater. I don't hate Jar Jar. There is only one problem with Jar Jar screen time. Every star Wars movie has something comic relief. Every star Wars movie has something cute. And then every star Wars movie has sort of a dark, serious layer to it as well. So well, uh, I mean, I'll say I, this: Look, if if you if you say <laughs> we're getting into a, a prequel debate, but if you say Clone Wars was for kids, I would say J Jar Jar Binks was for kids as well, and I, well, I and I think it was to to bring Star Wars to a new generation, and I think that's kind of what they right. tried to do here, and they had no nuance in doing it. Well, but it, okay, a, a couple things: Jar Jar. I actually thought Jar Jar. I remember when they introduced his his opening scene. I thought this is funny. Why are people complaining yeah. about about this? uh wait um heel versus baby face says we don't and i don't we don't what <laughs> we don't want what's the context as give me some context but back to okay so so okay back to, back to episode no, no, seven let me, let me okay go ahead my prequels thought in yes. retrospect looking back on the prequels uh they've aged better they've aged better there are parts of it episode one most practical effects most practical sets um Episode one, there are many good things about it. Probably the best, the prequels had the best lightsaber duels of all the Star Wars movies. And I would argue that the last third of episode two, when we see what the Clone Wars is, and we see, I remember the theater erupting in applause when you see this like sea of Jedi with lightsabers drawn, you know, about to clash with an army of robots. Like the theater went nuts. So there you go. Um, but uh, look, uh, the the thing is, the thing is this, like, like uh, the prequels have aged well and the generation that grew up that were kids when it came out really enjoyed it. Uh, I'll throw in a doc, uh, a, a, a film recommendation, a movie called The Prequels Strike Back. It's another documentary I happen to be in, but I'm not, I, I, I'm in a lot of, I turn up like in a bunch of different places. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, um. It's it's made by a kid who was a, who was young. He was single digit aged when the prequels came out. He's a kid from Austin, Texas, and he saw the prequels and loved the prequels. Then he got on the Internet as a teenager. He was like 14, 15. He's reading the Internet. Why do people not like the prequels? And he decided to make a movie that defended 
the prequels. It's a very good documentary and it's a different point of view. And I appreciate that. Now, as is comment, why do we care about Ahsoka? We don't, says Heel versus Babyface. Well, thank you, As, for that comment. Yeah, unfortunately, they didn't. There's not sufficient backstory to make me care about these characters. There's a lot of reference to backstory that's in a cartoon show that I never watched. I, I did watch season one of Rebels and certain episodes. I'd check in on Clone Wars. I prefer the Gendy Tartakovsky 2D animated, just the hand drawn animation. I really like that Clone Wars series. Um, I didn't like it when they kind of moved to the sort of weird big heads and it was a style of animation that felt a little weird. I just teach his own teach his own. And I, it just didn't resonate with me. I, but, look, um, look, I mean, uh, to, to as his comment, the, to me, the point, the, the biggest folly here was, you know, not a lot of people saw um, rebels and clone wars. Um, people, people who saw it are going to hate me for saying that, but let's, let's be real. Your numbers are small. You know, you looked at when you look at the season one premiere of Rebels, it was three million people on Disney XD. So it wasn't even on wow. the Disney Channel. And, and and to to make a series like this, spend spend uh, arguably a hundred million dollars to for three million fans, maybe let's say five million fans, five million fans. That's a that's a monumental waste of time and money. And and to and to create the show that is specifically for them, because those of us who don't have context, who have not seen those shows, this is this is how we react to what we're seeing, because we don't understand the context. We don't understand the backstory. And um, you know, these characters are are bland and inconse inconsequential because we don't know anything about them. And yet it's written as if we should. And and I don't know who in Disney I, I do. Who in Disney would greenlight something like this, spend this amount of money and think that it's going to be a success and think that they're going to get a return on their money? And which is why Star Wars is dying, because it's losing money. And this is an example of why. Well, I think the reason that the Disney Plus streaming service, I, I have my two favorite streaming services where I always find something to watch, Netflix and Max. If I had to cancel everything, I would keep those two only. But, um, I, but uh, everything else, when it comes to like Disney plus nothing new that they're creating interests me. And secondly, the other thing about it is that, that, uh, everything that I want that's on the channel, I already own. I have Bambi, Alice in Wonder. I have them all on Blu-ray. I have Snow White on Blu-ray. I've got the documentary about the making of Snow White on on dvd i've got i've got all the disney stuff i want it's like a shelf it's mm -hmm. all the classic animated films all the marvel phase one two and three and that's it that's i'm good that's all that that it has and i've got other little disney stuff here and there too but um there's really nothing keeping me on there as goes on to say as i should just send as a link uh, heel versus babyface the show hasn't provided any reason for us to care about these characters. Mm -hmm. That is 100% correct. And that is just like from the beginning, the first few. Now, this is the thing is, if you've watched Rebels and Clone Wars, I get it. But for the audience that, because I only really care about the movies. You know, if it happened, if there's a giant seven foot rabbit in the, um, you know, in, in the comic books, I'm going to say, well, that's nice. But unless I see it in the movies, it doesn't exist to me, mm -hmm. but they, they really needed that. The, the thing is, is they needed some episodes to, to put it in context here. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this. So, so let's, let's go through real quick. We've had so many chat let me, questions. Let me, let me just comment on that one yeah. last comment you made, but wouldn't it have been cool to see live action versions of the great moments of these characters from rebels? You know, I mean, if you, if you yeah. want to, if you want to, dig into those member berries you know that's what they should have done is is take episode one or at least put out put out a an hour-long documentary on these characters and 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 the stories of rebels and do it live action they could have done that and um and and that would have at least set a foundation for this series we we have no foundation no foundation is being built no, nothing's being explained to us 
And that's why people who didn't see the series don't like it. Right. I haven't seen Rebels, don't like the series. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I look, I watched the first season of Rebels and I thought, this is a show for little kids. And it's, and, and that's okay. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Even look, there are age specific demographics where they go after certain types of shows. I'm okay with like, Star Wars Legos existing as a show. So what? I won't watch it. I don't care. But that it exists is cool. It's entry level. It's fine. I, I don't mind. They even do this with toys, right? Like they've got the sort of little, you'll get like the little, whatever. Like they're like little kid toys that are Star Trek or Star Wars. Then they've got your traditional action figures. Then they have black series. And then uh, they've got the one six scale, which are much more expensive. And then if you're like me, I've sort of graduated to the point where it's like, I don't want any of that crap because I don't have the room. What I like are prop replicas. I love prop replicas. That's kind of where my head is. I love having a prop replica. Uh, that's cool. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with that. Uh, but, but um, you know, it's uh, when I watch those shows first, first, cause I gave them a chance. I just realized it's not for me. It's fine. I'll stick to the movies. If anything big happens, like there was an episode of the Gendy Tartakovsky uh, Clone Wars show, the 2D animated, that was a direct prequel to the events of Revenge of the Sith. And I loved it. I thought it was a really good episode. But I felt that what he was going for was a much more adult vision. You know, uh, people assume just because something is an animation form, it is for children. That's not true. I mean, I can tell you because I saw Howl's Moving Castle yesterday. Uh, but the opening of the show kind of told me where we're at. See, three PO makes a cameo, and they, <laughs> yeah. and and oh, here's three PO, three PO. Oh my god! Here's the thing: Mon Mothma <laughs> stops everything to basically say hello to Princess Senator Senator Leia Organa's toaster. My impression was is that nobody treated droids with respect. That's like treating your iPhone and a walking freaking iPhone walks in. To, to disrupt the proceedings with a message from Princess Leia. It's basically Princess Leia sent a galactic text using C-3PO. And they give C-3PO, oh, oh, all this respect. The better way to play that scene would be to be annoyed at C-3PO. What is this droid interrupting our proceedings? And then to have a hologram of uh, Leia Organa actually delivering a message instead of the way that they played it, which was this is Robert Meyer Burnett said this. And as I watched your review before this, and uh, I'm going to quote, we're all quoting Robert Meyer Burnett. Star Wars isn't about anything. Star Wars is now just about Star Wars. And I even tweeted today, something like, You know, we're getting to the point where basically someone in Star Wars is just going to be seen watching Star Wars. And then somebody joked in the comments that when they remake Star Wars on one of the view screens, they're going to be watching the old Star Wars. It's become about itself. It's not about anything. Epic Mike coming in hot. Agreed, Chris. Epic Mike co-signs everything I just said. Thank you, Epic Mike. You know, here's what they should have done with 3PO. They, he should have come in, been so annoying that they shot his arm off and then attached a red one onto it. There you well, go. There you go. I know. Well, there you go. And then I would connect it because because they're trying to make connections with the prequel of the sequels. That would have been so great. We, we got this opening scene with Hera, General Hera, um, being, you know, disciplined what's going on with that uh c-3po and a little deus ex machina is saves her or actually leia organa saves her we get ahsoka going through the the with the purgle which i still think is just a dumb idea i just think it's a dumb idea which i would buy it in animation i don't buy it in live action it looks stupid um uh so there you go then um you've got like the battle on the planet oh here let me let me talk about mon Moth. Uh, that okay so there's one thing that they're setting up which i don't know if they're smart if they did it because they're intelligent they realize it's a great story idea or if they're they just did it not knowing but 
Uh, I saw this in The Mandalorian as well, but one thing that I find interesting is that the whole New Republic, um, it's a government so bogged down by bureaucracy, and it's so big, that the government is so big that that it's allowing a, a subversive element to infiltrate it from, from behind. Um, and uh, and I think, I'll, I'll get some heat for saying it, I think they're doing a good job portraying that, especially for Mandalorian and, and this one, is you know that this government that everyone is following is so uh, so inept. Uh, it's so uh, ineffective. It's so powerless that that this is how Thrawn is going to get his forces in and to kind of undermine the the new republic from from within. I mean, it feels like that could happen today. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But uh, this is these are seeds I'm seeing planted throughout at least this Filoni verse. Um, but Part of me feels like he's not smart enough to have even picked up on that himself. Well, and that's my other thing is as we get into the show, Balin Skull is the best part of the show. Uh, and I don't think, I think the way they're going, they're probably not going to kill off his character and, and he'll have to be recast for the movie or if there's a second season of Ahsoka. Um, the, uh, the other thing, the other thing about this is Thrawn just seems not menacing. Is it just mm -hmm. me? We haven't seen what makes them so afraid of him and what makes him so great as yet. I have not seen it. Yeah. Look, if, we, if anything, he, he sent uh, like these few resources down to the planet. He, what would, what would have been a better take would be for him to be like, to underestimate them and to send off like, whatever. They're not going to like, he's not, they're not going to interrupt our plans. It's just like two people. You know what I mean? Like, like it would have just, there's so many different ways you could have played it. And it's all in the writing. It's all in the writing. I still don't mm -hmm. think the actor that's playing him is that I'm not sold, but I haven't yeah. seen anything that's made this character menacing. Whereas from the opening scene of seeing Darth Vader, very, very menacing. From let, the let, let's see this. Um, look, up until Avengers Endgame, we saw we saw less of Thanos than we have of Thrawn at this point. And we already knew how threatening Thanos was. Right. You know, we knew that when he finally made his appearance on, you know, killing Loki, that we understood that this was a this was a big deal, and this is why the universe is scared of him. We get nothing of that with Thrawn. You know, all we all we are told is that he's a really bad guy, and that we should just accept it. And this is my whole problem with Star Wars, with uh, with Disney Star Wars, is they tell us here are the bad guys and here are the good guys. You should like them because they're good. You should like them because they're bad. You should like them or hate them because we told you you should. And that's bad storytelling. Yeah, um, yeah, bottom line, we'll do a big wrap up of the entire season next week. Might be a special longer show, who knows? Um, and on, we are also, uh, bo bottom line on this, we'll do a wrap up of the entire series. Okay. We have too many comments, and we also have like okay. four other, four other <laughs> movies we were supposed to review. I'm going to bump those to Friday. Yeah. We're just going to do your comments. And I have two filmmakers coming on. Uh, I, I, we have two filmmakers coming on at the end here, but real quick, um, we're going to bump our re film reviews, including a movie called creation of the gods. Part one kingdom of storms, which is China making a Marvel movie. I'm not making this up. They even did a post credit scene, just like Marvel. I saw it in the theater. I'm going to talk about it on Friday. Friday may be a three hour show in order to catch up. So we're not going to, so we're not going to discuss any of these until Friday, Alan. Um, okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. We are literally Friday. We're going to review about. Dang it. I, know. I got, I you know what? Early. Maybe, maybe we don't do interviews live anymore. We just do interviews pre-recorded on our other channel. I'm just frustrated. We don't, we get on here and we're having oh, great yeah. conversation and it gets derailed from stuff. Uh, our interview is scheduled for two 30. So our interview is scheduled for two 30. We're not going to get to it till two 35. So Chris lawing, uh, just, uh, you know, yeah. you, can, you can hop back in at two 35. Yeah. All right. Your chat comments and questions. Let's go to it. Starting with super chats here. Contrarian 420 for two. Who's Ahsoka? 
The only Ezra I like is Ezra Pound, says Contrarian420. For two. Space Dave 2000 for two. Plans for your 100,000 subscriber event. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, How about we do this? You're going to think I'm crazy. We rent a carnival dunk tank. I did this for a party one. We put Alan in the carnival dunk tank. And every time we get a super chat above a certain level, the, the thing goes like this. Why? And you go in the dunk. Why? The dunk. What do you mean? Why? Why? Why is it just uh, me? Okay, Alan, me. if you don't do it, I'll do it. I'm going to see how much it costs to rent a carnival dunk tank. And where are you going to put it? I don't know. That has to be something more creative than that. What do you mean more creative? What's more fun than that? Than, than torture. Yeah. Dunk tank rentals as fast as same day. Hey, we got... <laughs> You just went on about having uh, to get through comments, and uh, and now you're looking up dunk tank. So, someone asked a question. <laughs> oh my! God. Plans for the hundred thousand. You didn't ask about dunk event. tank. We <laughs> might do a carnival dunk tank. Right. Ministry of Wrong Thing for nine nine nine. Ahsoka just literally won a female empowerment choice award from feminist critics organization. I'm not joking. You can't make this shit up. Yeah, it's actually, actually uh, the yeah, CCA. From, yeah. Our organization gave yeah the gave CCA, Ahsoka, an organization that Alan and I are a part of, gave that award. I had nothing to do with it. Hey, green elation for Uku. Sabine seemed more powerful and capable than Ezra. I didn't like how he refused the lightsaber. I loved Rebels, but Ahsoka feels flat. Nothing in Disney Star Wars delivers the payoff. Like Revenge of the Sith did in 2005. I love watching Revenge of the Sith and Return of the Jedi back to back. Recommended. Well, there you go. It kind of answers a question. Yeah, but we've talked Kevin about Rubio has. We've we've talked about the usefulness of a lightsaber, so you can kind of understand why. Yeah. Why Ezra did uh, only doing super chats here for the moment. I will get to other chat comments and questions. Darth Racer seven 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 for five episode seven. Ugh. Too many criticisms to list. Just no gravitas. Junior high school acting. I give it a three out of 10. Probably give it a little higher. Um, I liked some aspects of it. I actually liked the Ezra um, uh, not using a lightsaber. Like, I thought that was interesting. Uh, we haven't seen that really before, except maybe with Luke in Last Jedi. But uh, so I give it maybe a four or five, five out of 10, but only for the action scenes. Just the story and characters. It's not there for me probably a four uh remus for five ahsoka feels like a cosplay groups independent youtube star wars film no offense to cosplay groups i've seen some amazing fan films just amazing fan films uh r.i.p star wars nine 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 the prequels are great they have some issues not as much as people say i would argue however they have more emotional payoff than anything disney star wars has made there are Parts of the prequels that are freaking heartbreaking. Re all mostly in Revenge of the Sith. Uh, Heel versus Babyface. They should have. They didn't, and the characters aren't behaving like the show. Two people died, says Heel versus Babyface. I, I'm I feel bad as because I'm 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 bringing your comments up out of context, so I don't know exactly what you're reacting to. Yeah, he has one later on. That, uh... all right but uh, love me some as oh my god as is gonna play cyberpunk 2077 i am so jealous because i pre-ordered that last summer i just want a free evening where i am playing that game and oh hey as came in with 20 pounds ahsoka is massively missing male energy Male characters are being held back to prop up bland women with nothing interesting about them. I say a hundred percent. Yeah, but then we couldn't have given it the female empowerment award. Maybe as will be a part of our third show, our versus show. We're we're talking about launching a third live stream on like Mondays. We'll call it Monday movie talk or versus. I don't know. I haven't decided what the title of the show will be 
We're going to launch it after we get to 100,000. But yeah, no, it's it's true. I mean, this is maybe why Balin's skull resonates so well. He's got the gravitas. I like him as a mm -hmm. villain. But all of these conflicts, how many times is Balin's skull going to fight Ahsoka and there yeah, there are no there's no repercussions? Nothing. And Balin's skull is the only male who has that kind of gravitas in the series right. as well. Thank you, as Love you, man. Uh, Quatrina VR, don't ask questions. Just consume product. Mm -hmm. Until next product arrives. <laughs> Valiant Renegade. Hey, Valiant Renegade for five. His channel's blowing up. Big shout out to Valiant Renegade. Good afternoon, gents. Do a tandem dunk tank and let people decide with each throw which one of you goes in. Most dunks loses. Well, we'd have to make it like a super chat level. Like, so if you give a certain super chat level, then the dunk tank, then I go in the dunk tank or Alan goes in the dunk tank and we have like, maybe Ms. Peacock, he controls it somehow. We'll figure it out. I don't know, but we'll do like a big, I don't know what it is, but maybe we have to shoot it on video or something. I don't know. Figure it out. Uh, bad, bad coyote funky for 10 as a star wars fan i'm tired of being bored of live action star wars the wrong people are in charge people who think they are cooking but are serving unseasoned food must taste good to their close family only yeah it's disheartening to say that but kind of true kind of true so um let's i need you to unstar the things after i have read them that helps me so please if someone could help me with that no money G for 10. We know good stories can be made by a competent writing team. Like Picard season three, it left you wanting more every week. Everybody was talking about it by word of mouth from all ages because it was special. Well, there you go. Um, there you go. Uh, from the, and thank you, no money G. Frank for two pounds. Why do people keep calling me Chris? Ah. <laughs> uh, I know where you're going with that. I know where you're going with that. There you are. Um, thank you, Frank. Uh, Harry Anders for 10 Swedish Krona for 100. I can't watch a soaker, but One Piece was funny and engaging. I love One Piece. R2D2 uh, R2 is a pirate now. It's uh, R2 One Piece. So there you go. R2 Luffy. Luffy... Two arts. I don't know. I can't get that right. Um, I can't watch a soaker, but one piece was funny and engaging. I loved one piece raving about it last week. I watched the whole thing in two days. Thanks to your recommendations, Alan and Chris and nerdrotic and drinker and everybody. It was dope. I loved it. I'm on the second viewing now started watching it this weekend at a pool party. Alan does not look excited about the dunk tank. By the way, I've done a dunk tank for a party before. It's awesome, but you need, it's super fun. I did a party. I did a party. I did parties in the nineties that would get me canceled. <laughs> I'm not joking. I can only imagine. I'm not joking. Uh, the red Ranger for nine, nine, nine watched all of clone wars and rebels multiple times through this show is poodoo. You can't write characters properly when women try to be men and men act like can't act like men. Fair point. Fair point. Epic Mike is back. Wait. No. Nope. Uh, why? What are you doing? Oh, I was uh, unstarring Epic. a comment you had just read. Okay. You're doing a terrible job. That's <laughs> yes. all I want to say. Uh, Epic right. Mike, we got to have a meeting soon. Talk about some indie stuff. Oh Epic yeah. Epic Mike, I follow you. DM me. I'll tell you how the industry works. It's all criminal. Uh. War Monkey, his arm is red. OMG, OMG, OMG. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Oh. Oh. There you go. Uh, Darren Hughes, who's a member for five. Howdy, Chris, Allen, mods and chat. Are you familiar with the, yes, of course. Are you familiar with the Star Wars Machete Order? Episode four, five, two, three, six. It fixes a lot of things the prequels ruin. Yeah, that's awesome. I've heard of that. But I've also heard uh, you watch episode one. Like, I feel like someone could recut 
like somebody did it. Wasn't it Topher Grace actually recut it? Look this up. Topher Grace recut the prequels and did a private screening. I've met him a couple of times. Why didn't I get an invite? Topher. What's up with that? Uh, there you go. Larry. Thank you, Darren. Larry, Larry, one nine nine sends in a sticker question for everyone watching the show right now. Should we do our interviews live or should we do fewer of them? I think we might need to do the thing is this. I would go longer today, but I have to go to a screening that's in less than two hours in Burbank. I'm going to see saw X in Burbank. You're doing two tonight? Uh, I'm seeing Saw X and the Creator, yes. Okay. And then we'll have our Friday show. Uh, but I love doing the interviews live. I think maybe we need to cut back. Yeah, we need to because talk about that. We'll talk about it. All yeah. right. Hey, 680, 636 people on Rumble, says what? One Punch Man Tolkien fan. Hey, what? Rumble World, thank okay. you for joining us. Oh, yeah. Attack hey, everyone. Andrew Wall, Attack of the Clones is greater from take than gr takes from Alan. I will. I will admit, uh, it has a great lightsaber scene with Yoda and Dooku. Uh, I mean, the, the, last, the romance, the romance in Attack of the Clones is cringeworthy. It's, it makes it hard last, to watch. The last third of Episode Two, I enjoyed. Yes, it's like Episode One had its highlight, but once you got, it's like now I see where this is going. This is great. Look, and, and Hayden Christensen, uh, I'll say it, the acting in episode two, not that great. Not that great. Uh, Jake Lloyd level, not that great. Hashtag phone punk says Attack of the Clones, second best Star Wars, fight me. Fair. Fair comment. Uh, it's a, yeah, it has a great fight in it. It has a great fight in it. Anonymous Gamer. That and Sabine didn't show any affection toward Ezra at the end of the season of Rebels. She was in love with a guy. Now he barely got a hug in the friend zone. That was stupid. That was stupid. No, no one realizes what a powerful emotion romance is and how that elevates a film and how, how it connects people with a film. And, uh, and for some reason, Hollywood is removing romance completely from movies. 200 watt studio for two. All hail our ruler in the merciless. And as ruler, I want to bring it back. All right. All right. Kevin Ruby. I'm just going to go top to bottom. Kevin yeah, Rubio. Nope. Guys, why are you still watching it? If it's bad. I clocked out after episode one. Life is too short. Well, Kevin Rubio, Lucasfilm apologist and Star Wars super fan, and actually a friend of mine in real life. If Kevin clocked out after episode one, um, that's saying something. Yep. Robert Crockett says, awesome reference to Calvin and predestination. Channel shows its deeper side. We do have a deeper side with all the goof. goof. Alan, I like to goof around. I like to goof around, but um, I do take what we do seriously. Lord Thoth says, interesting analogy in The Merciless. Yeah, that's regarding the uh, divorced <laughs> divorced wife. Natalie Portman in the white outfit is worth it, says, hey, you for two. Bill S. Preston Esquire. I like the live interviews. Maybe need to change the order of the show, but interviewers earlier and leave open discussion for later. Maybe that's how we do it. Um we're going to fewer interviews yeah. or taped interviews for interview channel says RJP. Um, it's your show. Do what you think you think always fun. Well, thank you for that. Lord six, eight, nine. I like live interviews. So check and ask some questions to stitch. All right. We'll keep them live, but maybe we'll, I just, I, I care about what you guys think as much as I get sort of in a curmudgeonly mood. It's usually Alan's fault. It's always my fault. Thank you very much. It's all no, I think look, I think today always blame Alan. Yeah. Today, I think the issue was is that we are so we are so ingrained in this one subject that uh, we we let time get away from, from us. Well, we've got two really great interviews, so stick around. I want you, especially people like Epic Mike, to learn how do you make a movie, release it, and make money. I know how to do this. I might have Epic Mike on the show and do a live stream where he asked me questions and I just tell him I'll give him like phone numbers and contact info. I don't give a shit. I'll give him email addresses. Yeah. 
I like the live interviews. Yeah, so check and ask questions. Patrick Lemire, the interviews are our interactive film school. All right, it's not going to get yeah. rid of it. I'm just going to be, be I'm going to be better at scheduling. It's it's on me. Lori Ormond, always blame the Asian. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Chris hates Asians and Mexicans. So uh where's Polly when I need him? <laughs> yeah. I love here's the thing. I genuinely love people. And I love conversation. And I love conversation with people when we disagree and we can disagree respectfully. Um, people on Twitter don't know how to do this. They're cruel and mean to people who they don't know. I tend to not go after people and I don't even like to engage in discussions like that. I pretty much like a lot of my, um, a lot of my commentary on Twitter is like a joke grenade. I throw out the grenade, I leave, and then I just let it go off without me there. But where the wrath of Ing the Merciless says stitch. We need like now someone to do like some meme or clip. Uh, Andrew Wordna. There's a clip of a woman at a Starlog convention in like 1987 asking why there are no women in Star Wars. George responds the same we reason there aren't women in war films. Makes sense. Yeah, why, is that? That why is that? Makes sense. You, me, in the movies, Rebels worked because the cartoon had power couples. Sabine and Ezra working well, Hera and Kanan, Zeb and Callus, and Chopper and anyone. Yeah, Chopper's like an app. And I have no idea who Zeb and Callus is. Yeah. Bill S. Preston Esquire says, this is an Irish wake. We're drinking, remembering the good times, and we bury our loved ones at the end. Star Wars is dead. Richard Garcia. Never thought I'd get a theology lesson in an Ahsoka review. Thanks, Alan. It's oh. always like positive comments about Alan. <laughs> it's always that because i'm a nice guy all right next week we have our special uh wrap-up edition episode eight of ahsoka we'll discuss the entire season it'll be the entire episode i promise uh this friday we're going to review our record number of movies we might have a stream that's like three hours long i'm not prepare for it alan i updated okay. our we have this youtube planning document that kind of tells us like what movies we're talking about and Friday is insane. Alan is going to review a dog movie called muzzle. Is that right, Alan? Yes. So you're doing cats of Malta. I'm going to review cats of Malta. Okay. We're going to have a discussion about cats and dogs. So there you go, but let's get right into it. And hopefully I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, and we're going to pivot. We're going to pivot very quickly here. And we're going to talk to direct director Chris Long about his movie Penitentia. He is here to discuss the film with us on the Film Threat live cast today. Chris, thank you for joining us on the show. Tell us uh, how's it going, and thank you for your patience. Thank you for your well, patience. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm, I feel bad that I'm, you know, butting in on your Ahsoka jam here. No, that's all right. That's all right. We yeah, can, please. Uh, we need a break from it. You're actually our savior at this point. Uh, <laughs> tell us, tell us about Penitentia. So Penitentia is an independent feature film that I shot. Um, and we shot it in Missouri and Kansas. It's about a young attorney who takes on a pro bono prison rights case and gets drawn into um, a world of corruption and corporate negligence. And the main character really has to kind of come to terms with what type of attorney he wants to be when he's confronted with both the criminality and the corporate negligence of the prison system in America. So this is a, a, a fictional narrative, but is it based on any real life event or loosely based? So, um, so my father was a civil rights attorney for 50 years in Wichita, Kansas. Oh. And when he passed, um, I was going to his funeral and, and I, I really wasn't up for speaking at his funeral, but I, but I decided that I wanted to do something that kind of honored his memory and what he really cared about and what he dedicated his life for. And so that's kind of the, the, the germ of the idea for Penitentia. And then over the next couple of months, I started to write it. And then about four months after that, we went into production. Uh, first of all, that's really fast. I mean, that is really, I mean, 
a lot of stories I hear with indie filmmakers is it. I thought of the idea and then 11 years later I came up with like, I, you know, I mean, that's insane. Um, a question before we go to questions from our audience, I have to ask, how did you pull together the funding for this film? So we did a couple of things. Um, so we did some crowdfunding. It wasn't, you know, the crowdfunding wasn't significant, um, but it was something. And then um, I went to a few private investors and raised some money with that. I own a, um, a commercial production company. I've been doing that for about 25 years. And so I have access to, you know, I own equipment, I own cameras, I own grip trucks. So, so that really mitigated a lot of the cost of the filmmaking process. But, but I mean, we made it for $120,000 and this was a SAG feature film. So we shot it in 15 days. So that's, that's kind of, that's how we did it. And it was a little bit crazy, but you know, that's how we kept the cost out. Did you do the SAG indie contract? I did. Okay. So a lot of people don't know about this to the filmmakers there. And especially to Epic Mike, who may or may not still be in the chat. Um, there is a separate, completely different contract that as an indie filmmaker, you can do, you can look up SAG indie or go to SAG indie.com. I believe if the site is still up, uh, the contracts are actually literally right in the site. It allows you as a filmmaker to hire any SAG actor to be in your movie. What it does, and there are different levels depending on budget level, you are giving up some power to the actors. If the And, and, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, um, one of the things in the contract is that if you, if the SAG actor doesn't approve of the movie, you can't even release it. And I know this for a fact, because I saw a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio in the late nineties that was made, or it was the late nineties, early two thousands. It was made under the SAG indie contract and the movie never came out. And I met the filmmaker and Leo DiCaprio was there. This is when he was like this young, hot thing. And the movie was, the movie was not great. I'm not going to lie. It was sort of a mumble core thing. And Leo DiCaprio looked at it and said, I don't want people to see it. I have never seen that movie since. I don't even know if it's on his IMDb, but it was, it played the slam dunk film festival. If I remember correctly in the late nineties and he was hot all from the Titanic. So um, can you correct me about the SAG indie contract? That I don't, I don't think that that's the case, especially if you, if you have performance agreements, I mean, you have to make sure that you get all your contracts in order. So, but, right. but, but, but I will, I will say one thing about, about the SAG agreement and working with SAG actors. The fact that I had professional actors allowed me to shoot this in 15 days. If, if, if I had unprofessional amateur actors and were struggling through online, so not off book, you know, we're, we're, we're not getting performances right, that would have killed the timeline. But because I had seasoned professional actors, that allowed us to move so quickly. Yeah, it's, it's um, just having made done projects with SAG actors, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible when you have a SAG actor that can like just go through lines of dialogue, pages of dialogue and do it a little differently or give you a different take on something or make sure they remember certain actions and motions. There really is a reason that um, actors are uh, the ones at the top of their game are in SAG. It's, it's a joy to work with them. So, uh, and I've been fortunate to have that experience on a couple of projects myself. So you're right. 15 days and 15 days is about what you need to make a decent feature. Sure. Could you make a movie in a week? Yes. But you know, a little over two weeks is preferred. I made a, a feature in 18 days. Um, what are some of the, like, before we get to, we got some comments and questions from people watching, uh, live before we get to that, what are some of the things that you would like, I mean, when people, when you say out the, out loud, the words made the movie for a little over a hundred grand, people think that's a lot of money. First of all, when it comes to making films, it's not, especially a narrative film. Okay. I made attack of the doc for about a hundred thousand dollars all in that's legal. That's clearances. That's, and there's a lot of stuff we didn't pay for, you know? So, uh, but what would be your advice on making a movie at that budget level? Well, I mean, I think I would focus on trying to keep the scope of the film as small as possible. 
So that really allows you to have a smaller crew. It allows you to have less um, less locations, less company moves. You could work with the you know with a smaller crew as well as a cast. Um, I will say that I did not do that. <laughs> um, so 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 I, I I didn't drink my Kool Aid in that regard. Um, but but I do have the advantage of you know having almost 30 years of, you know, um, production experience. So I was able to kind of figure out what corners I could cut that doesn't, you know, basically blow up in my face. The other thing is, um, and it, when people have asked me for advice, uh, I, I always like the two things that add production value to a movie cast, which you had SAG actors and location. Where did you shoot? So we shot in two places. We shot on St. Louis, Missouri, and then we shot in Wichita, Kansas. The film is based in Wichita, which is, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's the, the city that my father loved. Um, by filming in Wichita, we really had an access to a community that really embraced the film. And so, so, so we got a lot of gifts. We got a lot of locations. And we were going into live locations. So that allowed us to basically not get bogged down with a whole lot of set dressing, a whole lot of production design, which can suck up time, suck up budget. And if you don't do it properly, can really take the viewers out of the film and they don't believe it. Gotcha. Uh, we have a bunch of questions and comments from our audience. Let's go to those questions. If you, I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're okay with it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Hieronymus says law movie, sign me up. And Immortal Remus says, question for Chris, being an independent filmmaker today, did you shoot on 35 millimeter or digital? And did you have a preference for what format you wanted to use? So I shot on digital. Um, I shot on digital for a couple of reasons. One is a very simple reason. I own the cameras um, and I do all of all of my commercial work on, on digital. Um, I shot when I was in college, I shot an ND feature um on on film on 16 millimeter black and white film and that was the cheapest film you could get but the problem is is with that even back then and, and you know if you're not in la you know getting dailies being able to you know see what you shot quickly that that becomes a, that becomes a, a a problem for indie filmmakers but then it's also just so much more expensive to shoot on 35 versus digital and, and for me, what I look at, I'm, I'm not really an iconoclast when it comes to the image. What's most important to me is, does the story make sense? So I'm not going to get really bogged down into, into the te technicals of the lenses or what cameras or what film stock. I, I'm, I'm much more practical in the regard of like getting the narrative down making sure that the audience isn't taken away because I'm, I'm so geeked out on some sort of effect or some sort of, you know, technical aspect that 95% of my audience isn't going to pay attention to anyway. The, the, the uh, other thing that I would point out when it comes to shooting digital is that you can actually, uh, in the color correction phase of making a movie, you can make it look like a particular film stock. For example, the this film I produced years ago called My Big Fat Independent Movie, we used the same cameras that George Lucas used to shoot uh, Star Wars Episode Two, which was the first all digital shot Star Wars movie. And what George Lucas did, I, I remember because I have read, I'm sure you've read, Chris, uh, American Cinematographer Magazine. Love that magazine. Um, what he did was, so he shot it digital, but he made it look like the same film stock that he used, he added grain that wasn't there to make it look exactly like the film stock from when he shot the original Star Wars film, uh, the, the scenes that were set on Tatooine in Tunisia. So just because you're shooting digital doesn't mean you can't make it look like film. Yeah, so I shot a short film about 10 years ago about the House of Un-American Activities, um, about Bertolt Brecht, the playwright. And we shot it digital, but then we went through in the 
in the color grade and we added a ton of grain, we did black and white. And the reality is, is that you look at some of that stuff and then you look at archival footage and it's, it's hard to differentiate between those. Yeah, it's Sweet. just, um, yeah. it gives you so much latitude. I'm sorry, Alan, I cut you yeah, off. Yeah, let me ask you one question about the story, but it, your fa it's inspired by your father. Was he more the Ali character or the Marvin character? And maybe you so want to illuminate was, on that bit. Yeah, so so the story actually centers around a young attorney, Ali Viacano, and um, Ali is a young up-and-coming attorney. He has a mentor, Marvin Weissman, and Marvin Weissman is the character that my father is based off of. But but Ale, when he was in law school, had clerked under Marvin, but has now taken a job at um, at a corporate firm. Um, Marvin is famous for taking on these pro bono cases that basically no one else wants to touch. Um, and so and so Ale gets drawn into a case um, that you know through Marvin, and that's that's really how Ale starts to really. Kind of, has this this crisis of conscious of like what type of law do i want to practice do i want to be like marvin or do i want to chase you know the, the the corporate dream and be a really successful attorney and we have another question here from our chat uh well we've got a couple more and then we have we have another guest waiting in the wings uh, uh mr john garcia will be joining us momentarily uh, probably the next five minutes, but we've got three questions here. Um, let's see. Akanika asks, what was the feeling on the last day of filming on set? Um, you know, it was, it was mixed. It was a mixed feeling because we had gone through a lot of, uh, there, there was a lot of production challenges. I mean, we had, we were filming in the middle of that, that um, Omicron um surge so we had we had one person that caught covid and shut down production for 10 days really jammed everything up um so so we were like trying to slam through a whole lot then we were also dealing with crazy midwest weather so that had changed a whole bunch of schedules so so there's this sense of relief but at the same point we also knew that we would have to come back in a couple of months to um to do some pickups for me, I felt there was just an emotional exhaustion because it is a gauntlet. Another question here from Greasy Guido. Did you visit any prisons for research? If so, what was it like? Um, you know what? I didn't visit any, any prisons. Um, most of my research was, um, you know, secondhand research. We, we did film in a jail um we we actually walked through um we had access to a, an abandoned prison that was initially going to be one of our sets and and you know i mean they're they're pretty creepy i'm just going to say that it's definitely not someplace i want to be outside of a film set well prison is one thing but have you ever stayed at a courtyard marriott <laughs> they're not i mean uh you know uh There's something even... similar there they yeah, the continental breakfast, not not. Yeah, bad. yeah, continental <laughs> breakfast, which is like a a sad pastry with an expiration date two years in the future, which is always suspicious. And a final question here from a Mister Solomon Thornton says, "Greetings, Sir Chris. I guess you've been knighted now. Uh, any advice for beginning filmmakers?" <sighs> you know, I mean, that's such a broad. It's, it's such a broad thing because, I mean, what is the beginning filmmaker? I mean, it, it, what I, the biggest thing that I would say is, is that just work on films, find productions, volunteer. You know, if, 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 you're, if you're a film student, work on everyone's film. If you're not a film student and you just, you know, when you just want to get involved, start finding short films that are being shot just start working on that and that's where you build the network but that's also kind of how you get into it i mean the first film i ever worked on was a film called grinders that was shot in 1994 and maddie labatique was the dp of that and that was oh the first i know maddie feature. labatique uh, yeah maddie yeah. he's inc i mean that guy is one of the most talented yes i yeah uh, sorry yeah and, and and that was the first film i ever worked on i just happened to walk on and you know when i was checking it out through a friend and they're like hey you want to work and i said yeah and and that's the first film i ever worked on wow and uh we have uh the website for the film uh, up here penitentia 
Com, which you actually got the you actually got the name of your movie so congratulations with that <laughs> and a, a quick comment here from raymond Britton white says just watch the trailer the quality is impressive for the budget well done sir what story is next or will there be a sequel well i mean i've got two films that that i'm in development on uh, one greg's going to rehab which is in the 80s coming of age story and then i have a film called liberty which we shot as a short film, and that's playing a tall grass film festival as well. But we're looking to develop that as a feature. So I, I'm I'm trying to you know I'm trying to keep myself busy and trying to get as many projects off the ground as possible. Well, congratulations, Chris, on the film. Go to penitentia.com. We'll have the link in the description after the show. We'll put the link in there, and you can find a review on filmthreat.com. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate talking with you. Thank you. Take care. Have a Thank good you. rest of your day. Appreciate All it. All right. Thanks. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. We're going to pivot for a minute here. We're going to pivot very quickly. Wait, what are we doing? Uh, we're Wait, doing... We're, do you have, you have to, we have to, okay. There's It'll help. If you help me, you can help me with the banners. Yeah, it, yeah the can banners switch, right underneath the one in the last one. To a it's, different topic. It's in order of the way you said. You said put it in this order. It's in that put order. Put it in this order. It's at the bottom of the list. All like you know what? Here's what I have to say. You can read these questions if you can't see them. You know what I prefer? Well, this oil it, it is amazing. She is the first female action hero ever in a movie. Well, look, she's ni he's 19 years old. She's 32. Whoa. I'm glad you got in your Power Rangers outfit there, Alan. That's great. But joining us uh, on the show is a director. We've spoken to him before. Um, he has been on the show before. Uh, director John Garcia... Which you made, um, you made this really amazing romantic film. Uh, I'm, I, the name is on the tip of my tongue. I don't want to misstate it. That's okay. It's uh, maybe it's Love in Dangerous Times or or Love in Dangerous Times. Okay. Lo Love in Dangerous Times is a film we talked about. Got a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I really love that movie. It was it was a couple that tries to date during the pandemic. And all of the problems that, you know, they're Zooming and leaving messages for each other and talk. And they kind of fall in love or at least like, strong like, over uh, new forms of communication. I thought it was such a smart film, uh, really well done at the budget level. And you're back to talk to us. So look up Love in Dangerous Times. Um, and John is very prolific as a filmmaker. Your new movie is Summoning the Spirit, which... I don't, I don't want to ruin it too much, but it does involve Bigfoot. Let me just say that. And yeah. in an event, it, 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 I thought this, okay, I didn't, I, this is what I do when I sit down to watch a film. I don't want to watch the trailer, mm -hmm. especially if it's an indie movie. I don't want, I thought this was a completely different movie until about halfway through when it, when it's revealed. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to give away too much, but where the hell did you get this idea for summoning the spirit? Yeah. Cause it's like, you know, it's, yeah. Like tell us the story and where you, where you came up with it. Yeah. I, um, that's funny. I've, I've been asked that question that same way. A few times. <laughs> right. Like, like where, the the hell? Hell this, where the hell did this come from? Um, first off, I want to say, um, <laughs> Hey, uh, it's not, it's nice to, it's nice to meet you, uh, Alan. I've met Chris. I've talked with Chris and you, you, you you've reviewed, uh, oh, yeah. I think two of my movies now, sex, weather, and and also um yeah. uh lose and he had nice things to say about them and i also feel like film threat like really like supports the filmmaker i mean i really feel like you guys really like um i don't know i feel like you guys know what goes into making these movies and you're very like sensitive to the fact that yeah we're sensitive people and like what you say and like what you put out there into the world you know about our work matters you know and people are going to read it and i just really like I really like what you two do and I just, I'm not, I know this sounds like I'm just throwing a bunch of fluff, but I really mean it. I really do like what you guys do. And, and I'm, uh, thank you 
for like watching yeah. my movies and talking to me about them. I appreciate it. So well, um, I mean, your your movies well, are very interesting. I, I Sex Weather was uh, it was just kind of like came out of nowhere. I actually mm-hmm. bumped into the uh, the star of it, Amber, on uh, on Twitch, and didn't realize it was her until like uh, several months after watching her stuff on uh, <laughs> doing Jackbox streams. That's and so then Love cool. Love in Dangerous Times was also uh, you know the really the first COVID movie I saw. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I love the movie poster for Love and Dangerous Times. I posted it on our Instagram because I I, I, am, I have a huge, I love movie posters. Me too. I just, I collect them. But your poster for that just really stood yeah. out to me. Cool. Um, me too. You know, that was a $2,500 movie. It's kind of crazy that it happened the way it did. You know what I mean? It was just like, I mean, not, I mean, there, there are, I, there are IOUs definitely, you know, on that, you know, but but uh, you know, we all wanted something. We, you know, you know, and that and that time of turmoil, I went, I went toward movies. I was like, I'm really sad, and things are really weird. I'm gonna make a movie, you know. And then I think, and I go ahead. That movie, I saw at exactly the right time because it was during the pandemic and all this. And you had made a movie during the pandemic for twenty five hundred dollars. This is why, like, look, okay, I, I appreciate what you said earlier when you were blowing smoke up our ass. <laughs> about um, about wait let me th- about I meant like, all the smoke though. Well, you know, you, 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 I appreciate like you know look because we were talking earlier about the TV show Ahsoka on Disney mm-hmm. Plus, but I tell the problem is is you have a lot of aspiring filmmakers that they want to make Star. Don't try to make Star Wars. Try to tell a story that can be engaging. You can always throw spaceships and aliens and all that stuff in later, but I'm mm-hmm. telling you, just tell a story. Like um, this is Love and Dangerous Times. I've never forgotten about that film. Something about that movie. It's I think because the the lead actress in it is also a very very attractive woman. Uh, but but it's mm-hmm. it was such an honest film about the pandemic and we didn't know what was going on and people were just like the whole masking thing and how do they get together and how are they like trying to have a romance through that? Period? You were reflecting exactly what was happening at that time. And it's such a beautiful movie. And the fact that you could also like, you can make, if you know how to shoot and work with actors, you can make a movie that, that moves you. And I also like that your movies are like, usually like a tight 90 minutes. Like you're just like, you know how, you know exactly what to do with that. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, they all, I mean, the first cuts are all two and a half hours, of course. Right. Of course. As they are. And same thing for summoning the spirit. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, all just right. one more thing about Love and Dangerous Times. I mean, like we yeah. were, it, that was all real time. Like we were like learning more about, about yes. COVID-19 as we were filming. We're like, well, we maybe, do we need to go? I mean, we just were going off what we knew at the time, like spraying off our groceries. Like we went, we went into Fred Meyer here in Portland and like, there was no toilet paper. We got like the last roll or something or one of the last, <laughs> roll. you know, it was, we were, it was all real time stuff, you know? And, uh, and, and thanks for mentioning Tiffany. She is she is pretty amazing, um, uh, just all around beautiful inside and out. And she hasn't she hasn't done anything since. I'm trying to get her back into a movie. She's about to move back to Portland, so maybe that, maybe that can happen. You know. Um, but, but by the way, I, I should say, uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry yeah. I should say when I mentioned Amber, it's Amber Stonebreaker, not Amber Heard. So yeah, haven't worked with Amber Heard. No, no, uh, no, no, not yet. Uh, but yeah, Amber Stonebreaker is uh, is she's killing it in L.A. right now. Yeah. She's doing great. Great work. But so, so where did it come up with the word me and the co-writer come up with this idea? Well, I, I really wanted to, uh, you know, it's hard to avoid Bigfoot things here in the Northwest. I live in Portland, Oregon, everywhere, bumper stickers, whatever, you know. Um, and I've always wanted to make a creature feature. And I figured I'd make one about Bigfoot. And I was really, in, in, I was really watching a lot of documentaries about cults and I was really uh, into cults um during the pandemic there's, there's there seemed like to be an influx of of documentaries the one about teal swan on hulu which i particularly loved you know because it was almost like not a cult you know but it was definitely a cult you don't really it's like you find yourself in this this community you want community all of a sudden you know you begin to realize oh okay this is like the the will of one person you know type type situation so i i liked i liked that you know and i wanted to make something Um, I wanted to lean into the comedy a little bit more, you know, in something, but like, you know, but still keep it subtle. I don't know if we succeeded or not. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, there was just a lot of uh, trial and error in that film. And I think when I realized 
that I that I should go ahead and make this movie because it was all an idea. And I had a couple of people, like two other people with me, two of the producers, Joe and Lacey, that were like, yeah, let's do this. I don't know. I've never made a Bigfoot movie. I don't know why I feel compelled to make a Bigfoot movie, but I want to make this movie. That, that was kind of the underlining feeling of it all. And then um, and then Angel came out of nowhere. Um, you know, the uh, Blair Witch, uh, the uh, Blair Witch Project producer, uh, Greg Hale, um, my uh, I went to PSU, Portland State University Film School here. I graduated from there in 2009. And the Alumni Association would would, would uh, reach out to me for, uh, you know, if I want to, you know, um, donate some money, contribute, you know, what have you. And and we were having a meeting. And then um, she told me, like, do you know Greg Hale lives here? You know, he made a Bigfoot movie because I told her I was looking for a suit. I don't have a suit. If I don't have a suit, I don't have a Bigfoot movie. I can't afford a CGI. You know, but it turns out that uh, that he made a Bigfoot movie called Exist which I'd watched and I really, really liked. And I thought the design, like the design, and because I watched all the Bigfoot movies, right? You know, to prepare for my Bigfoot movie. But I, I love the one in Letters from the Big Man, I think it's called, also shot in Portland. And I love the one from Exists. And uh, I asked him if he had the suit and it turns out it was in a warehouse in Los Angeles. And, and, they, and all I had to do was go pick it up. And so like, you know, I was like, okay, well, I have to make a Bigfoot movie now. I have to make because I have this suit, you know, the, the suit costs more than the movie to make, you know, by by a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and it was such a cool design. So I drove down to L.A. and I picked it up. Um, I picked it up. Uh, it was the same studio that 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 did that did Hellboy. Hellboy was their first film, uh, Spectral Motion. It was the first film that they did. And they built they built upon that, you know. And when I picked up the suit, I couldn't believe that they were giving it to me, you know, and, and just uh and like, you know, I remember like walking slowly, slowly to my car. I was like, really? I can take this with me? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? You know, and it just driving away slowly with it. Are you sure? And then I and I got it back here. I showed it to everybody and I was like, we're making a freaking Bigfoot movie. We're going to do this, you know. <laughs> and so that's um, that's how that's how it came to be. And um, I remember like, you know, in the midst of making this movie, I started off wanting to make something very like serious, you know, the serious cult and the serious couple and Bigfoot means business. And then, you know, as we, you know, just doing scene work is like, you know, I love, I love like, you know, all the work I do in pre-pro and post and all the, everything is just so I can spend that, that 25 days working with actors because that's my favorite thing to do in the entire world. And I only get to do it like once a year if I make a movie, if I get to make a movie. But I remember like just doing the scene work and, the, and just finding moments for levity within it, you know, um, or that I wanted there to be more, more levity going through it, I was, I remember thinking like, do I want this to be campy? I kind of want it to be campy. I kind of, I kind of want to be serious in parts, but going back and watching the film, I realized I didn't necessarily commit, you know, to, to, uh, to a singular mode overall, overall. And so in some aspects, it's serious in some aspects, it's campy in some aspects, it's, it's horror. And it just kind of, um, it was a big experiment for me. That's how I viewed it. I viewed Bigfoot as like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make somebody in the spirit and I'm going to let it be what it is. I don't make horror films. I'm not a horror film maker. I've been watching a lot of, you know, I love Midsummer. Midsummer obviously was like, you know, a huge inspiration for this movie as were like a few. And I just, uh, for me, it was a big experiment, you know, and, uh, and I love making it, you know, now I want to put big gory bloody scenes in all my movies even my romantic ones you know like i don't know you know it, it changed me uh it changed me as a filmmaker now i want to like i want choreography i want to like have you know i want to like just uh try different things you know so um but I, I gotta tell you it was just uh making that movie was just uh it was a real it was just it was a ton it was a ton of fun it was also very traumatizing but it was well I'll, I'll i'll say um i didn't expect that coming from you I mean, we get a lot of indie horror films, but knowing your previous work, that's you have sort of a, a very natural style that your characters and, and you know, in your films, the actors engage in. We've got a, a bunch of questions from the chat. Do you mind taking some questions? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, here we go. Imperfect asks, pig's blood or cranberry juice? Oh, wow. Wow. Pig's blood or cranberry juice? Um, let me see. We... Well, I don't know what I don't know what Melissa used. Uh, Melissa Barakman, uh, she was she's great, and she uh, and she made she did all the blood and stuff. I know for brain matter, we used uh, peach cobbler and food coloring. You know, <laughs> um, you know, 
Snakes yeah. and Funerals said, can't argue with that logic. You had to make the movie because you got the suit for free. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you know, it was there was more than that. There was more than that. You know, I definitely wanted to make the movie. But I mean, once we had the suit, we're like, yeah, yeah, this thing, this suit's amazing. Like, let's and, let's go for it. You know, and Aid Ellis 24 says, what is it with the people of the Pacific Northwest and their passion for cult? Maybe it's the, uh, you know, we had that, uh, I should know this because they, they were in, uh, um, oh, what were they called? You know, they wore the red, you know, um, the Duplass brothers back yes. documentary about it. Yeah. 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 Anyway, anyway, but yeah, but the, yeah, there's, there is a, a fascination with cults out here. Definitely. Um, yeah, guys, I, I, I wanted, uh, yeah, um, um, th thanks for like making some time for me here. Of course. I, I really appreciate it. Um, love talking to you guys. Uh, please keep reviewing my movies. Um, and I love that you guys, I love that we can sit here and talk about not only this movie, but, um, you know, Sex, Weather, Love and Dangerous Times and and uh, Even Lose, which you all uh, also um, also reviewed. And so, Well, we've yeah. got more questions. We got like three more questions and we'll, cool. and then I'm off to a movie believe it or not. All right. Um, yeah. Let's see. Raymond Britton White says, John, how did you get such natural performance from your actors in Love in Dangerous Times? Oh, that's, thanks for asking that. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I've been doing this a while and I really love it. I think we, you know, we did a lot of, uh, like I, I was trained in Meisner and we did a, like a, we did a lot of like Meisner-esque type uh, exercises. You know, and we also like, uh, as you know, like, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of improvisation can can always you can get some cool like natural natural performances from people. We just let them put things in their in their own words, you know. Um, uh, and I remember like I did an exercise with, with Ian, or you know, uh, who played uh, the lead in that film, and we were just uh, and you know, since the only the only um, uh, form of training I had was Meisner. I remember I just had him repeat something repeat something until he, until the words, like, until he actually had a physical guttural reaction, emotional reaction to, uh, to what he was saying, you know, but, um, yeah, I think the improv also, also gives, a uh, a lot of, allows a lot of room for, um, for some real natural performances, performances. Um, it, it comes yeah. off that movie, the two actors, your two leads were so authentic because I'm going to guess they were dealing with, all of those things in reality yeah. in addition to the reality of the movie completely completely yeah. we were all we were all like not in remember we had to check in with each other at the, at the end of every day like how are, how are we doing how are you doing yeah 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 Yeah. are we doing okay i don't know if we're doing okay are we doing okay i think we did the same thing for bigfoot too because that thing was such a big thing for me you know and yeah solomon thornton asked sir john i guess you're a sir now how did you handle the budget for the film? I know this, I mean, Love and Dangerous Times was cheap. That was 2,500. Mm -hmm. This one, I don't know if you want to reveal the budget, but. Um... Yeah, yeah, I'm totally okay with that. It's $160,000 for this movie. And we had, we had four different, uh, we had four different uh, uh, investors, producers. And then I, I also put in some of my own cash. Um, and so that's, that's how we got it. And, and uh, we asked for a lot of favors you know, and for a lot of favors here, I've been making movies in Oregon for a long time. And also, you know, um, the, the incentives are good here. They're really good in Oregon. And so, you know, we kept that in mind and kept that uh, um, in mind as we were going through our budget. And, and we actually, you know, we didn't we didn't do too bad. There's things I always forget something in the budget. And this year I forgot, uh, you know, some legal and I forgot to okay. include taxes, you know, so I'm paying the taxes out of pocket, you know. And so it's just there's little little things like that. We asked for a lot of favors. We did, you know, and I'm realizing like making that the $150,000 feature, $200,000 feature is kind of like, it's becoming more obsolete, you know, for me, you know, as far as the way I make films, you know, with inflation and everything else, you know, but I say that, but then, you know, there's an 18 year old Australian filmmaker who just, who's kicking ass making $7,000 movies, you know, one after the other, you know? And so, you know what I mean? So maybe I need to rethink the way, I do this. I prefer sets like Love and Dangerous Times and Sex Weather, um, uh, like three people, four people on a set. I love that. That's like my favorite. That's like, and I think that's part of like how you get the intimacy of performances. And it's hard when you have 13 people, you know, and for us, you know, we had, you know, sometimes 20, uh, 20 cult members, you know, 
and I'm, I'm directing in front of 30 people and I'm a really shy person, you know, and I'm just like, you know, so I like really, I like real, real intimate, you know, um, type situations, but, um, yeah. So the budget, we just, you know, also our producer Lacey is super, super economical and just very, just brilliant about where, where and how we spend money. Um, and like, you know, I remember she had a, you know, she had a fair bit of the, of our kind of day to day, the coolers, the, you know, you know, the, just, just everything that we needed to kind of run, run the, run the set throughout the day. I mean, so we, we had, did you have your own, did you have your own cameras and audio equipment or? Was no, we, 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 we rented the camera. I mean, so, so the, the, like the uh, DP owns, uh, owns the camera. It was, it was an RE, it was an RE, the classic, you know, and it just looks so beautiful. And I mean, and it saved us that that was like a 2.5, uh, you know, K, um, you know, um, camera because it, you know, drive space became a lot, a lot easier to handle. Cause I have a red, uh, I have a red, uh, Komodo and I was, I was getting scared about those six K files and I didn't want to shoot in five K or four K cause then it would crop in. And so, um, I was really excited that, that to use that camera, it also handles light. It's just, it just looks so beautiful. And I see the difference now. I, I used to be a red person more now, more of an RE person. And I hope I can keep shooting movies with an RA. We shot Love and Dangerous Times with an A7S uh, two or three, I forget. And and um, and that was also that was also great because we didn't we didn't even really. I had one light. We hardly ever used any lights in that movie because the A7S uh, two or three was uh, just so so damn beautiful, you know. And so it takes in light so well, you know. A question here from Akinika. Seems like you love everything about making a movie, but what is your least favorite part of making a film? Yeah, I think uh, I think raising money, raising money is not <laughs> is not fun. Um, and also, yep. you know, I think it's really scary. Like I was with uh, I was with our producers when I got the first review for for uh, for um, summoning the spirit, and it was bad. It was real bad, you know. And we're we're, you know, and it came in in the morning, you know, and then they um, and they asked me, hey, have any reviews come in? I was like, oh, you know. We got one, you know, we got one, you know, was it good? It's like, no, no, it wasn't good. You know, but, but I heard there's more coming. I heard there's more coming, but by noon we had like four really positive ones and then I was having a better day. But I think the scariest part about, you know, about releasing a movie is waiting for those reviews. And I wish I didn't care. I really wish I didn't care, but I do. I care so much for the first week or two after a while. I'm like, okay, I know what it is. I, I have a basis of how it's going to be received. And and so I have this feeling, I, I mentioned this in sex weather and it's just like, I don't know. It's like, no matter how hard you work, no matter how, you know, blood, sweat and tears and all that, it just, uh, it doesn't mean people are going to love it, you know? So it is, I know it's, I know what part of it is, is the experience, right? Is, you know, this way, you know, yeah, I, 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 I walk out of every movie a different person, you know? So I think, I think, so to answer your question, I think uh, the raising money and then when the, when the film comes out and waiting for those first reviews is very, is very scary, very scary thing. You know, and then a sure. final question as we wrap up the show, Sons and Shadows, who's a member asks, question what's next on your docket or would you need to kill us all if you told us no no <laughs> uh, i would not and and uh so i'm working on a uh there's a few there's a few i've, I've got one called the state of limerence and it's about in the near future if you break somebody's heart you're responsible for helping them get over you it's a government mandate program you can be subpoenaed for breaking somebody's heart and so it's it's illegal uh, without uh without helping them through it so you have to go through a weekend retreat with them and i'm working on that and I wanted to shoot it. I wanted to shoot it now, like with, like this month, you know. And I'm trying to shoot it by the end of the by the end of the year. Then I have another thing I'm working on. It's called Pass the Guard, and Pass the Guard is a mixed martial arts LGBT type film, um, and it's uh, it's mostly Latino cast. And I've been working on that for like eight years. And I'm a huge UFC fan. I actually, the UFC flew me to flew me to uh, Las Vegas to at to apply i was up for a position in their media department but all i talked about i talked about bigfoot the entire time and then i asked them if i could uh if i could actually leave for a month and make a movie and come back and they were like no no you can't do that this is a job and i was like oh okay so i lost that i lost that opportunity but um but but yeah i'm i'm, I'm very into mixed martial arts and i'm really excited about this movie and we're talking to some ufc fighters that that I've been, I watch, I've been watching for a long, long time. And so those are the two films that um, I'm really, really excited about right now. Maybe get them to fund it. I'll bet they could fund it. I mean, 
Yeah. Well, I think we might. I think, got a deep I think we might have some financing on this on this one, and it's not from the UFC. I think getting sanctioned from the UFC is like a whole ordeal, is what I've learned. But that would be nice, you know. But you know, Halle Berry was able able to do it for uh, for her her MMA movie, which was really good, by the way. You know? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, John Garcia, thank you so much for being on the show. Summoning the Spirit is the movie. It is now is out now on video on demand. You can check it out. It is Bigfoot is. Uh, Bigfoot is in the film. That's all I want to say. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin anything. The ending to me is a shocker, and uh, you're you're going to enjoy it. It's uh, not the movie you think as it begins, which is which is what I really enjoyed. So awesome. thank you, John. Let us know this other movie. The the Limerence movie sounds really interesting. The future. You've got to go on a retreat. Yeah. And I, that sounds like that sounds really cool. I like speculative or like science fiction that's like that. It's, it's very me too. Different. Me too. And I I don't think. I don't think it's going to make a lot of money, but I still, I still, I still want to do this movie. I'm trying to, I'm going to try to love and dangerous time sex, weather it just yes. like, you know, mm -hmm. few people, you know, four person crew. And like, I'm trying, I'm trying to get it done by the end of the year. We'll see. So awesome. anyway, thanks guys. All right. Appreciate thank you. Care, thank take you. care, John. Thanks. We'll see you again. Uh, when your next movie is out. All right, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. Take Bye. care. Thank you later. Uh, that was great. Love it. His movie, Love and Dangerous Times. Check it out. And uh, somebody. Well, you sex theater. weather. Watch sex weather. And sex weather also. His movies. His movies have sex. His movies have sex. Uh, I gotta go. I'm gonna go see Saw X. And the creator. You and I have movies to go to. Yeah. So I gotta leave. So we're gonna leave it at that. Uh, I want to thank you to our mods, Lord Thoth, Paulie from Latino Slant, uh, Ms. Peak Coffee. Also thank Glenn Brown our producer and just thank uh, all of you for being a part of it. Chicago box also and grid iron masters. Uh, love it. Solomon Thornton says, love these interviews, learn something new all the time. We will continue the interviews. I'm just going to be better at scheduling. See, we need to do a third show so we can do this. This is, we have too much stuff to discuss and our third show will likely be a group show like Tuesday night's main event. It'll be like sort of our own version of that with different people like Verbal Riot, maybe Polly. We'll see. Like a, a more of a group type. But on Monday. on Monday. But on Monday, which is why uh, the name we're considering is Monday Movie Talk. So we'll see. Alan loves that name. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nothing controversial Alan? about that name at all. Nothing. What there's nothing controversial about I that know name. that's what I'm saying. There's nothing controversial about that name. That's what I'm trying to say. And also check out go to shop.filmthreat.com. Or if you're on YouTube, check out the tab that says store. We're gonna have, I am told, before uh Black Friday, we're gonna have more than 20 new t-shirt and merch designs in the shop. We've been sitting on these all year. We're doing a big shop reboot and as well as other products so go to shop.filmthreats.com support our efforts and go to filmthreat.com read alan's reviews and other people from film threats reviews you can read about you know john garcia's movies he really is prolific this is a guy that like he yeah. makes a movie once a year and it's a small indie movie a uh, summoning the spirit is a bit more ambitious you know big bigfoot costume you know cast of uh bigger cast so um I really like watching he, his movies are very intimate. That's what I'll say. And follow us on everything. We're at film threat. As you can see, I think I'm going to turn that graphic. It's in the background. I'm going to turn that into a t-shirt. Does anyone recognize it? Does anyone recognize the, the little graphic? Nobody does. All right. That's okay. That's okay. But thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone. We'll see you on Friday. We're going to review. It might be a record. I'm going to count. There's like more than 10 movies that you and I will have. We're, we're seen. definitely not going to get through all of them. No, we're doing a longer show. Yeah. And we have uh, two filmmakers coming on. No One Will Save You, which is on Hulu. We have the director, Brian Duffield, and The Kill Room, director, Nicole Pion. Starring Samuel L. Yeah. Jackson and Uma Thurman. We might have to push that to next week. I don't know yet. All I could say is this. It's Friday. I'll go three hours. Alan, three hours show on Friday. I can do Friday. Yeah, I can do three. Okay. All right. We're going to do a longer show on Friday. So someone got it right. Hey, Jillian N, who's a member. 
It's the whatever podcast. Yeah. You know who told me about the whatever podcast was X-Ray Girl. X-Ray Girl is the one that whenever, whenever the kids are into something, it's usually someone like X-Ray Girl is telling you. Hi, Dad, I miss you. Call your daughter. I know. She needs Call to. Your daughter. She's to upgrade the things she watches. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, thank you, Jillian N. You noticed that. I'm going to turn that into a T-shirt. Why not? It's just Helvetica. It's the Helvetica font. Yeah. And Sean Farrell and says, the, Sean Farrell says, whatever podcast had Bigfoot on it too. I think you're talking about Gorlock. And Brock Sanson says, yeah, cool show today. Awesome. Uh, so there you go. Uh, thank you, everybody. You know what? Even thank you to the people who disagreed with me and said mean things. So it says, someone says, fix that clip so loud. Jesus, what are you listening on? Like headphones or something? Well, it is loud. It It is is loud. loud. I don't know what to, like I'm technical, you know? I I just don't know how to turn the volume down on that one. A movie talk show would run all night. Yeah, Monday movie talk. But it would be with a group of people and we talk about the box office and whatever and it would be more of a group chat. Anything else? And then Jillian said, I would love a shirt, says Jillian N. We need to get, I don't know if that's your actual picture, Jillian N. But uh, yeah, we have to get, right now we just have unisex. We should get girl, female size, assuming that's a picture of you. Jocelyn says, hail film thread. Thank you for that. Uh, Thank you for everyone. All right. I'm not going to do, this is like, what do they call this? The Italian. Cool down. Cool off period. What? No, the the goodbye. I'm taking too long to say goodbyes. It's the goodbyes. That's what. All right. Alan, what? Just a second. I'm not ready yet. (laughs) All right. Alan. I'm seeing greater too. Is that what you asked? Alan, we got to go. Yeah, I know. Let's get out of here.